Dear friends and colleagues, I'm extremely happy to welcome you from this uh, magnificent 18th century room at Palazzo Clerici, ISPI premises in Milan. Since uh, symbolism matters over us, Giovan Battista Tiepolo, one of the most famous painters at the time, represented in his fresco the world as it was, as it was known at that time without Oceania. The perfect place to host our T20 Global Policy Forum, where we will discuss the world as we want it to be in the near future. A forum co-hosted by ISPI, the T20 National Coordinator and Chair, and by the think tanks and civil society program of the University of Pennsylvania in cooperation with EI. Why ISPI and why the think tanks and civil society program promoted a T20 Global Policy Forum? It is our responsibility, the responsibility of T20 and the international community of think tanks to provide policy-oriented proposal to the G20 for a sustainable and more equitable future. The main source of this proposal will clearly be the 160 policy briefs produced by almost 600 authors from 53 countries. An inclusive and diverse effort by itself but to make it even more inclusive and diverse, to collect more comments and ideas, the Italian T20 this year has added, I would say in some cases revamped, two further steps on top of the activity of task forces. First, the T20 Spring Roundtables, 16 events on key global challenges which engaged over 500 experts, civil servants, and representative of the business community, 16 virtual events co-hosted by 30 leading think tanks from all continents. The second step is today, today and tomorrow, the T20 Global Policy Forum, co-designed with the think tanks and civil society program, thanks to Jim, thanks Jim McGann, an event that will offer a preview of the main recommendation coming from task forces and collect reaction from a few hundred think tanks, today's audience, with a geography that goes far beyond G20 countries from all over the world. At a very timely moment, a few weeks before the draft of the final communique is delivered to the G20 leaders. People, planet and prosperity. The priority of the Italian G20 will echo often today and tomorrow at our virtual room. You are all invited to contribute using our chat box and help us make our effort, effort as inclusive and policy-oriented as possible. A last comment. In the early phase of the pandemic, more than a year ago, ESP launched the social media campaign in dark times, think tanks keep their lights on. It is now time to build a better and more equitable future and think tanks need to turn even more light on. With this in mind and thanking again Jim, all our partners, all our panelists, all the keynote speakers, I'm glad to start the Global Policy Forum and leave the floor to the co-host of the event, Professor Jim McGann. Please Jim, over to you. Paolo, thank you very much. I must start by um, commending um, ISPI uh, and the previous uh, institutions and countries that have hosted uh, this G20 and keeping uh, the promise of the G20 alive during this very difficult uh, period. Uh, and uh, additionally, making a firm and demonstrable commitment uh, to um, inclusion uh, and participation uh, to help sustain and to make policy relevant uh, the work of, of the T20. And so I wanna welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good mi middle of the night for, for some, uh, for this uh, very important and auspicious undertaking. The ability to uh, reach out, to create 
both solidarity and inclusion among the global think tank community at this moment, more than any other time, is both essential uh, and critical uh, for both our countries and for the role and importance that think tanks can play in the world. And most importantly, the commitment to helping save both livelihoods and lives and our planet um, in this uh, very pivotal, and I would say existential uh, moment. Uh, as many of you know, I've uh, worked to create uh, a global community of think tanks. And this meeting and our participation in it uh, is uh, part of that commitment to build and to make sure that all of the think tanks across the world are consulted and involved in the process uh, that um, impacts uh, their lives and livelihoods. And so uh, I want to thank once again um, ISPI for putting together an extraordinary event. We have 700, 800 think tanks that have registered for this think tank, in addition to policymakers, uh, policy activists in civil society, uh, and other um, sectors of the global uh, um, community. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our uh, opening uh, speaker um, and uh, get uh, and launch uh, the Global Policy Forum. Sigmar Gabriel is former vice chancellor of Germany and now the chairman of the, the uh, Atlantic Group. Uh, Vice Chancellor, uh, I have a question to pose for you uh, to open uh, the uh, discussion here today. How and to what extent can the G20 and other multilateral fora better deal with the global challenges of a post-pandemic world? And how can think tanks better help policymakers to design a policy response to help save lives and livelihoods and our planet going forward? Vice Chancellor. Yeah, Paolo and dear Jim, thank you very much for inviting me to make some comments at the beginning of uh, the working meeting today on the question whether the G20 are suitable, a suitable format for dealing with the global challenges that lie ahead of us. I can only report on this from my practical political experiences, so I hope not to bore this high-level group of experts with my perspective. The question whether the G20 could be a format to better address global challenges can only arise because other existing formats are obvious not sufficiently suitable for it so far. The G20 and the G7, for example, are not because essential states and regions of the world are not represented in them, and they rather represent the most important countries of the post-war order of World War II in the second half of the 20th century. In the last few decades, the United Nations and the United Nations Security Council have increasingly become a forum for political block blockade, which at the decisive moment always been stopped by a few states through their right of veto. And at the same time, there is no globally dominant regulatory power in the early 21st century that would be able to enforce binding rules and standards on its own. So if neither unilateralism, regionalism, or multilateralism are sufficiently capable of adequately addressing global challenges and above all, implementing them in binding practical action within a reasonable time, then only G20 remains of the existing formats for international cooperation left. A format that also proved to be relatively successfully during the 2008 financial crisis. 
in order to answer your question of whether or to what extent the G20 can play a decisive role in dealing with global issues in the future, I would like to brief, briefly return to my own experiences in this format. Because starting under the American president, George W. Bush, there was a G20 format in which the international climate conferences of that time were to be prepared. The background was that at that time, resolutions of the climate conferences, of the international climate conferences, regularly failed because the US refused to give its consent with reference to a lack of binding contributions from China. And conversely, China referred to the historical burdens on the climate by the US and Europe and first demanded massive advance payments. Many other participants then hide behind one of these two countries and were occasionally happy that the climate conferences were not progressing because they would then have to have to more do themselves. For this reason, the so-called major economies meeting was founded by George W. Bush, which had exactly as many participants that make up the G20 today. Mockers also referred to this meeting as a major emitters meeting. His successor, Barack Obama, continued these meetings, and in fact, it was possible to get a lot more movement into the international climate conferences, which always take place at the end of the year, up to the adoption of the Paris Climate Agreement. In my memory, the major economies meetings, the G20 at that time, have done good preparatory work in these years. And their acceptance was also due to the fact that many smaller countries in the world felt themselves represented in a certain way by the country of South Africa, that from the tradition of the G77 plus China saw itself as a kind of lobbying body for economically and politically weaker countries. But of course, there are also contrary experiences with the G20 meetings, the declarations and resolutions of which are not formally binding. In my opinion, the G20 failed completely in the pandemic. While the G20 finance ministers meeting in Washington with a joint action plan to stabilize the world economy came very quickly after the financial crisis of 2008, there was only one meeting at the foreign minister's level in the current pandemic, which failed without any result because the participants couldn't even agree on a name for the virus. The US absolutely wanted to call the coronavirus China virus or Wuhan virus, which of course arouses resistance in China. Often the G20 served more to present, to present the host country's domestic politics or the importance of the international role of the host country's leader than actually to serve the goals on the official agenda. In addition, the rotating chairmanship does not make it easy to bring continuity to the work of the G20. If we want to give the G20 meetings a bigger role, we need some changes. For example, the UN Secretary General or the Secretary General of the OECD could take the chair, although I know that the OECD be, will be a problematic as long as countries like China, India or South Africa are still not members of the OECD. Secondly, one could also consider whether the G20 meetings should not always take place at the, um, uh, should always take place at the side of the United Nations to signal that the G20 has a global responsibility and also to keep the enormous security effort under control, which is necessary again and again to prevent violent protests against the G20 meetings. Thirdly, there should be a permanent executive committee of the G20 in order to maintain the continuity of the work. And fourthly, and it would definitely make sense to give the G20 an international scientific advisory board. Above all, however, a G20 format only has a chance if those involved are willing, despite major political differences in other areas of international politics, to concentrate on jointly, jointly solving the challenges that affected all states equally. The more we de develop into a bipolar dispute between China and the US in the style of a Cold War 2.0, the more difficult it will be to come to forms 
of cooperation at the G20 level. I fear that we have not found not, that we not have found yet the right relationship and balance between confrontation, competition, and cooperation in this new bipolar world. An important role, and that was the second question I was given for today, was the question of the role of science. The good news, there are institutions where experts and scientists are working with the annual presidency of G20, for example, the Global Policy Forum or the Global Solution Initiative. The problem, however, is that in my experience, the actual influence of this scientific and civil society support of the G20 process has remained rather small. In truth, the G20 meetings are still shaped by the national priorities of the host country and by topics from the international agenda brought by the other 19 national Sherpas of the G20 members. But of course, it doesn't have to stay that way. Substantial support from a formalized scientific and civil society advisory board could be essential to make the G20 more effective, both for their insights and recommendations as for their critical review of government policies. They are at times the nudge it required for governments to leave the comfort zone. This scientific advisory board should be more of a think space than a think tank. And it would be a very good case in point of how experts can meaningful contribute to better responses to our common global challenges. It would be a kind of a recoupling project which brings together think tanks and academics from around the globe to think about how to counter the most dangerous trend of the future of multilateralism, the return of my nation first, and with it a decoupling from international cooperation with a mutually agreed framework. So let me end here by thanking you for your attention. Vice Chairman uh, Gabriel, thank dear Sigmar for your enlightening and realistic remarks. Uh, the perfect opening for our forum. Uh, and we now move into the first of our four sessions, Global Policy for People, addressing extremely hot topic, global health, multilateralism and migration. Hot topic, hot panels, starting with three uh, keynote addresses. I, I have the pleasure to give the floor to uh, Kevin Rudd, former Prime Minister of Australia, President and CEO of the Asia Society Policy Institute. Uh, Prime Minister, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Paolo, and uh, good to hear just now from Sigma. Uh, I endorse uh, his remarks in terms of the future of a G20 secretariat to give it long-term focus. Good to be here also with Carl, uh, one of Europe's uh, most uh, intellectually acute contributors to the public policy debate across the world. And uh, thank you to uh, our friends in Italy and to Jim McGann and the University of Pennsylvania and the work they do to support the operations of think tanks around the world. Now, Paolo, you mentioned that you're in Milano. I've been to Milano a few times, not a bad town. Um, in fact, uh, quite a good town. Um, lots going on in Milano in a normal season. You mentioned uh, the Palazzo that you were in and the Mappa Mundi that you have there. And uh, the Mappa Mundi actually uh, lacks certain parts of the world. Well. That's what we call the Eurocentric worldview. Um, and that is uh, uh, a lot of parts of the world that actually disappear off the edge. It reminds me of when I went as prime minister to see the Pope. And if you go to the Vatican apartments and you see the marvelous Mappa Mundi from the 16th century uh, arranged around the walls of the papal apartments, uh, no Australia, not much of Southeast Asia. And frankly, um, uh, India is a... Uh, a cartographical error, and as for China, well, not much better. But it's an interesting insight into the changing structure of the world. The term Asia, for example, meaning the East, is a construction of uh, Western psychology. Uh, that is, it is to the East of the West. Um, and because you are in the West, you get to name the compass points in relation to yourself. Well, that's about to change and is changing. I don't say that as a matter of um, East Asian celebration, just as a matter of pragmatic reality. By the time this decade is finished, 50% of global GDP will come 
uh, from uh, this hemisphere, uh, the Asian hemisphere. And as a consequence, therefore, the world continues to change. That's an underpinning economic reality. So based on those um, uh, observations, let me make four or five very quick remarks. Uh, one, uh, what matters in determining global uh, decision-making. Uh, two, uh, the G20, G7 architectural split. Uh, three, US-China within the G20. And then four, pandemics and five, migration. On the first, what matters uh, at, uh, let's call it large global gatherings, you're about to host the G20, for example, in Italy, I remember attending a major economies uh, meeting in Italy at, uh, in L'Aquila just after it had been destroyed by an earthquake with the uh, unforgettable Silvio Berlusconi. Um, the bottom line is, in my experience, and perhaps Carl will have reflections on this as well, is that in making decisions, three things matter. Ideas matter. They really do matter. The most underrated element of the trilogy or of the trinity the second is institutions themselves in, as it were, preparing uh, the uh, machinery for decision-making and the execution decision-making. And three, the alchemy of leadership. If you miss one of those three, as we'd say in Australia, you bug it. Um, it doesn't work. Um, ideas, institution, plus leadership. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that, uh, for example, in a gathering of G20, you're going to have 20 leaders. Two or three are very helpful. Even one will do. Uh, if you don't have any, then again, you're in difficulty. The second point uh, was about the G20, G7 split. Um, the G7, as you know, essentially is um, uh, the West plus one, Japan. China's critique of the G7 is that it's Japan pretending to be in the West. And so it really is the West. The G20, and remember it was a Republican president's innovation, George uh, W. Bush, uh, actually extended the membership so that now eight of the 20 actually come from uh, Asia, if we include West Asia as well. Um, Sigmar is right. Uh, when you looked at the critical and rapid decision-making response to the global financial crisis, as a participant in those meetings and as a co-founder of the G20, uh, it worked well but it worked well because of ideas, the institution, the inherent legitimacy of bringing people from all continents, plus leadership. Four or five people actually made it happen. And when we look to the future in terms of the uh, unfolding dichotomy between the United States and China, the reason the G7 doesn't work anymore for global decision-making, it may make, it works for decision-making within the collective West, is that the G7 does not have China at the table, nor does it have Russia at the table. Both of those are at the G20 table. And it therefore becomes the critical institution to find and navigate a way through for the future. That is important. Third point I was going to make is, so what about the US and China and can it work? Um, a lot of our think tank work in New York and the Asia Society Policy Institute which I have led for the last five years, is around this idea of managed strategic competition. It borrows some principles from the earlier period of the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States immediately following the Cuban Missile Crisis. How could you manage this deep strategic competition between Moscow and uh, Washington without permanently being in danger of sliding off the, off the edge into crisis, conflict and war? So when I've argued, for example, and stuff I've written in Foreign Affairs magazine and elsewhere for managed strategic competition, it is not a utopian vision. It is a very pragmatic realist vision of how do you identify strategic red lines and manage them? How do you therefore provide space and scope for full-blooded competition across the rest of the foreign policy and economic policy and frankly, ideological space but thirdly, simultaneously within the same framework of managed strategic competition or MSC as I call it, creating space for continued bilateral and multilateral collaboration on the things that matter. Which brings me to, rapidly to my two last points on pandemics and migration. Uh, the G20 
the UN, the WTO, everybody failed on the pandemic. That's the truth of it. Uh, it's an uncomfortable truth, but I think Helen Clark uh, and President Sir Lee Johnson, uh, Johnson's recent report underlines that fact in, in stark non-polemical terms. The key question for the future is, will we marshal the global political leadership through the G20, because it brings both, as it were, wings of the international community together, uh, plus the non-alliance, is can we, for example, create an emergency crisis notification system within the G20 and therefore executed through the WHO, which, which does not yield to any level of political interference anywhere. So that if there is medical advice from Wuhan, from Washington, uh, or from uh, Westphalia, uh, which points to an emerging pandemic problem, the scientists take control, the information flow begins immediately, and the scientific-based responses flow. That takes power out of the hands of governments at a political level, but it does put power in the hands of the scientific community to deliver us the best responses and advice on what's happening and what to do about it. And my very final point um, is migration. Uh, migration, of course, has dropped right off the international policy agenda because of the pandemic. Guess what? It's going to come back. In the case of the United States and Mexico and the border, it's already back, but it will come back for the rest of us as well. The sooner the G20 does the uh, hard, very hard institutional redesign for the uh, International Refugees Convention to establish a balanced set of responsibilities between source countries, neighboring countries, transit countries, and destination countries in the hands of an effectively functioning uh, global institutional arrangement, then we are gonna to continue to have all the destabilizations and uh, inhumanity that we've seen in decades past. So there are five quick reflections, Jim and Paolo, on the points you've asked me to address. Thank you for your time. Jim, <clears throat> we can't hear Jim. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, clearly, as you have indicated, ideas, institutions, and leadership matters. That will be amply on display uh, as we uh, hear from leaders uh, and from institutions around the world during the next two days. I like now to ask Carl Bildt, former Prime Minister of Sweden and WHO Special Envoy for ACT Accelerator to make a few comments about um, the measures that the G20 has taken to deal with the global health emergency. What else is needed at the international multilateral level, level to better face the pandemic and prepare us for the future and the inevitable future pandemic? Paolo? Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be with you, Paolo, uh, Sigma, Kevin, uh, wise voices from around the world. Let me start with a quote. The world is at an acute crisis for devastate, acute risk for devastating regional or global disease epidemics or pandemics that would not only cause loss of life, but upend economies and create social chaos. Those were the words of the report by the Global Preparedness Monitoring Panel that was issued in November of 2019. Nearly two decades before the SARS coronavirus raged for six months, affected 29 countries, killed uh, more than 700 people, was something of a wake up call, or to be precise, should have been. In the years that followed with H1N1, with Ebola, with MERS, among others, no less than 11 high-level panels issued 16 different reports with recommendations of how we should increase our preparedness in the new age of pandemics that we had entered. And the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board was set up by the WHO and the World Bank to monitor how prepared we were. But the brutal fact is that very few of the recommendations were acted upon and few of the reports were read 
outside the circles of those already convinced. The rest, as they say, is history. If we look back at this pandemic, I would say that particular local authorities in China lost about two weeks when it should have been acted faster after the new virus had been detected and sequenced. And the world as a whole lost two months at least when it should have acted faster after the WHO in January 30th declared it, as it's called, a public health emergency of international concern using all of the red lights available to the WHO. It was really only in April that things started to happen. Act A was set up late April, 85 days after the declaration by the WHO. And it was a framework to accelerate all the efforts in providing diagnostics, treatments and vaccines. And from its vaccine pillar came the COVAX facility that was supposed to help low and medium income countries with access to vaccine. The record since then is, I would argue, a distinctly mixed one. It's a story on the one hand of tremendous scientific success and on the other of a rather profound political failure. The first vaccines were ready for clinical trials in under a month with safe and effective vaccines available after a mere 307 days. That was a world record. And today there are eight vaccines that have been given green light by the WHO. Twice as many are available in different countries. And there are now 102 vaccine candidates undergoing clinical trial. It's a tremendous success of science. But politics is um, not an issue, and I restrict myself to the global level. Uh, there is an understanding in general terms that no one is safe until everyone is safe. As long as the pandemic rages, there remains the risk of, that new mutations and variations might appear complicate the situation further and at worst start to roll back and unravel what's already been done. And as far as the economy is concerned, Kristalina Georgieva of the IMF has been very clear in saying that today pandemic policy is the most important economic policy. Calculations of the IMF shows that an investment of $50 billion in diagnostics, in treatments and in vaccines would bring an improvement for, to the global economy in the order of $9 trillion, including, by the way, an increase in the tax income of high income countries in the order of $1 trillion. It's real money. Few investments are as profitable as that. But in spite of that, I have to say that the outcome of the recent G7 meeting uh, was disappointing. There were no further commitments of resources to bridge the immediate funding gaps, roughly $16 billion identified by Act A and commitments of vaccine dose sharing fell distinctly short of what had been identified as absolutely necessary. So it's an uphill struggle for the D20. We now see that globally reported cases have been declining for eight weeks. That's a good story. But if you look at the figures for Latin America and Africa, you see steep increases, and that is most worrying. In Europe, the so-called Delta variation that first emerged with such devastating force in India is now rapidly gaining ground. It has already been identified, by the way, in 85 countries around the world. And new variations of concern, as is the official term, could well emerge. The Lambda variation first identified in Peru might well be a candidate. And mind you, it's only 15% of the global population has had any access to vaccines overall, that's a fairly small number. And in order to bring the pandemic to an end, there is a need to vaccinate roughly 70% of the global population until next summer. That makes it necessary to have roughly 11 billion doses of vaccine available. There's an unprecedented effort underway to do this. It's a complicated one, and it's hampered by vaccine nationalists, it's hampered by quite a number of trading restrictions and export restrictions that, surprisingly enough, they've come down in number, but they are still there. And there's a need for much more in terms of diagnostics. We are flying blind in large parts of the world. And there's a need for treatment. We must not allow the oxygen crisis that we saw with such horrifying effects in India to be repeated in Asia and in Latin America. By the time of the G20 in Rome, 
there will be a strategic view of Act A. There are the different other panel reports. Kevin mentioned the report by the Helen Clark, the independent panel. There are the 100 day report of the D7. More is bound to come. But we need to focus now, I would say, on getting the resources to fight the pandemic. 85% of the world hasn't have access to any vaccine. We need to concentrate on getting the money there. It's an investment that is worth doing. And after that, start to focus on what can be done thereafter. There's a World Health Assembly special meeting coming up in November on a pandemic treaty. I think there's a lot that needs to be done at that particular time. We were not prepared this time. We must make certain that we are better prepared next time. And just remind finally that it might be that we have been very lucky this time. If the virus had been as transmissible, if there has been a virus instead of this one that has been as transmissible as COVID-19 has been, but as deadly as SARS, that could have been, as someone has said, a civilization shattering experience. So for all of the depth of this particular crisis, haha, perhaps this was the warning shot that we needed. And we really need to make get our act together. G20 will be critical for that. We failed this time. Uh, we won't have the room to fail another time. Thanks. Thanks, Prime Minister Bill. Thanks, dear Carl. And, and good luck for your important task. Uh, we know we are in good hands. Uh, <laughs> I, I now turn to Agnes Kalibata, Special Envoy for the UN Secretary General for the 2021 Food Systems Summit. She could not be with us at this time, but she kindly recorded a brief message that we can show now. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me start by thanking T20 for inviting me to participate in this People, Planet and Prosperity Global Policy Forum. This forum comes at a time when we still have over 700 million people going hungry each day. At the same time, the UN projects that our population will grow from the current 7 billion to around 8.5 billion by 2030 and 9.7 billion by 2050. Continued population growth will substantially increase the demand for food supplies. All these speak to the need for us to step up all efforts to, to transform our food system, to see us through these unprecedented times and stay ahead of this growth. The ability to meet our targets is further limited by the looming food crisis and famine emanating from climate change and conflict situations around the world. Through all these, we have learned that without improved food systems that provide nourishment, incomes, and equity, many of us are just one crisis away from extreme vulnerability. That's why it is important to identify solutions and measures we can implement. And that's why the Secretary General launched the 2021 Food Systems Summit to catalyze action, recognizing that food is central to all 17 sustainable development goals. Food brings us all together as communities, as nations, as regions, and the entire world. Food is our culture. Food is who we are. The focus of the summit is to catalyze global transformation change across five areas. Ending hunger and nourishing people, reducing our impact on climate and biodiversity, advancing resilience, improving livelihoods and empowering people, as well as shifting to sustainable consumption. Our hope is that through national dialogues now happening around the world, food system actors with the leadership of member states and engaging all constituencies from producers, processors, distributors, retailers, and consumers will have space and a chance to share and learn with a view to fostering new partnerships, building coalitions while amplifying existing solutions and initiatives. As we go into discussions at the T20 People, Planet and Prosperity Global Policy Forum, we await and look forward to your insights on how to advance our food system. 
This forum has the capability to enable all of us to clearly draw the connection between food security, health and nutrition, nature positive production, equity, resilience, and sustainability, all of which are at the heart of the objectives of the Food Systems Summit. As we take our place around the table at the Food Systems Pre-Summit in July and later in September, in, at the summit, we will have opportunities for further collaboration in advancing game-changing solutions, national pathways, and transformative partnerships. I thank you once again for this invitation and for the T20 strong leadership and support for the 2021 Food System Summit. And I look forward to our continued collaboration and collective action towards the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. Thank you again. Thank you to Agnes Calibata and again a special thanks to Sigmar Gabriel, to Kevin Rudd, to Carl Bildt. Uh, I now leave the floor to Liliana Faccioli Pintozzi, Sky TV, who will moderate the three panel of the first policy session on people. Liliana, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you, Director. Good morning, good morning, good evening, or good night to everyone. Um, so let's start with the first panel. The panel will be about global health. You know, we are running a little bit late, so I will be sweet and short in my introduction. Uh, we know during this year, most, more than one year, 18 months of pandemic, almost 4 million people died uh, globally because of COVID-19, while access to vaccine has been often slow and uneven. How can the G20 and the T20, of course, contribute to prevent future disease and build fairer and resilient health system? And to quote Mr. Carl Bill, to avoid another political failure. So let's talk about, about this with our panelists. Let's start with Mrs. Paula Testori Koji. She is the lead co-chair of T20 Task Force on Global Health, special advisor of the Italian Technological Cluster of Life Science Alize. So good morning. Uh, so may I ask you, uh, can you provide um, a brief overview of the preliminary result of your task force, especially on the One Health approach, data sharing, surveillance, and the importance of health literacy? Thanks. I, I think you must, uh, we cannot hear you. I am not mute. Okay, okay, now it's okay. fine. Okay. Now, thanks for inviting me to this important event. Our task force has worked, as Paolo Magri said, has worked you know, very actively, and we received a lot of policy brief. And our, our preliminary conclusion are the following. First of all, the importance of data. So the COVID pandemic has demonstrated how critical it is to dispose of reliable and comparable data. During the entire pandemic, but from the outset, until the management of the pandemic. Because at the beginning, you know, data are important to decide which interventions should be done tailored at the spread and the virulence of the virus. Then population health data lay at the core of an effective and equitable response to emergencies. So data are essential to design policy making which is based on evidence and also to evaluate the intervention that are likely to have the greatest and the most effective impact against the pandemic. Clearly, the insufficient availability of meaningful information in all these areas has been one of the most significant weaknesses revealed by this pandemic. So we are making you know, some proposal in our task force. First of all, for improving the present system for detecting health threats, which you know, has proven, you know, as, as the, you know, the speakers before has said, has proven to be inadequate and slow to respond, we propose a new independent, incentivized and scientist-led platform that would enable scientists and researchers to share information in a peer-to-peer -peer network free of any political constraints. Scientists, both in the public and in the private settings, will be driven to contribute 
thanks to a new system of incentives that reward collaborative information sharing and cooperation, because this is important. We need incentives to have this voluntarily participation and reporting by scientists. And as Prime Minister Kevin Rudd said, it is important that scientists take the lead. Secondly, for improving epidemiological surveillance and allow targeted and gender responsive intervention, we propose that the reporting uh, of data on testing, case, death, uh, hospitalization, long-term effects uh, is harmonized and disaggregated by age and sex. So we propose to have the standardized to develop standardized format and good practices for sex and age disaggregated reporting to be used at local and national level by all countries. It is clear that the lower resource country will need some support in order to collect data and to use this standard format. And then we consider it should be the WHO which collate, report, and publish this disaggregated data. Then, if we look at our health systems, it is clear that the pressure caused by the pandemic on our health system is only destined to increase because mainly of three factors. There is a, an increase of you know, environmental degradation. There is a connected risk of new zoonotic diseases, including resistance of uh, resistant pathogens. And finally, the demographic trends. So it is necessary that our health system improve from one side their preparedness capability so that they can respond to crisis, but also they can improve their capacity to guarantee the everyday quality health care and prevention activities. And to this aim, our task force has identified four you know, actions, which are priority action. Now, first, we need to develop a balanced model you know, of health care, which incorporates hospital center and decentralized community-based approaches. Second, to invest more in the health workforce, which has been critical you know, during the pandemic, to develop sound health information systems on health determinants, health system performance, population health status, and finally, to guarantee equitable ac access to essential you know, care for everybody. Finally, on one health... I'm you know, sorry, you have a 30 second. Now, the COVID has demonstrated that the One Health approach is the only valid strategy which enables us to prevent or to mitigate health threats. The tight interconnection between human, you know, animal and environment now is recognized by everybody. However, the adoption of the One Health approach in plans, policies, structures, both you know, at national and international level, requires you know a big change because because it address it involves you know governance research education training and if we want to overcome the present fragmentation we really need to make an effort to change you know structures uh, uh, policies and institutions so our task force call on the g20 to i'm really sorry framework for the integration of one health in prevention and preparedness at all in all national and international strategies and plan. Thank you very much. I'm really sorry. I need to cut short. I'm sorry, otherwise we won't have time to talk with everybody. Thank you very much, Mrs. Testori Koji. Um, let's talk with Zmita. Sorry. Co-chair of the T20 Task Force One on Global Health, Professor Research Fellow. Uh, Open University, United Kingdom. Uh, so my question for you is granting universal and equitable, equitable sorry, access to vaccine is a goal reaffirmed by G7 leaders. Uh, what are the preliminary findings and takeaways of the T20 on these issues? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, very nice to be here on, on quite a difficult time. Um, I really want to respond to this in the following way. Um, I will be reporting and supporting uh, the findings of uh, Dr. Paola Testori, who's gone before me. I will just add uh, some of the interim discussions and items that have come out from 
some of the discussions around uh, the production diagnostics therapeutics issue, global health equity, gender equity, education, regional cooperation. Why are these important? Because there is a philosophical moment here, which I just want to allude to, which is we've been very quickly reminded by uh, the virus that a multifaceted approach to healthcare, our coexistence as people, seeing ourselves as part of nature is essential. But it is also true that it is underscored that a significant technological advance that has taken place in many areas is quite separated and divorced from issues of access. That does really remind us that also a disproportionate attention pre and during the pandemic, not surprisingly, has gone towards infectious diseases and global health. But many health challenges where we are advancing technologically around the world remain much broader, perhaps in some respects, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic even more urgent. This requires that healthcare is seen as much more than medicine. And we have seen that a new architecture, this is particularly relevant to the T20 uh, as we go forward, a new production of knowledge is required where think tanks, universities, experts, scientists of different kinds find a way in which to effectively work together. I think our own um, task force is an example where we are trying to bridge complex data and looking through our own disciplines and professions that we have some very specific recommendations. So let me turn to these. The health system is really not separated. Let me re-emphasize what the speakers have said, not separated from essential social and economic activity. That means that issues such as education, uh, gendered activity in the workplace, uh, and traditional industrial activity have to be pulled together in a way that can be reconciled with issues of uh, health equity. For this, we need data. This is a point that has already been made and I will not belabor it. But on the question of equitable access, we really have a fundamental uh, decision facing us. We must boost health capacity along with the accountability of the production systems that we have working for us. What do I mean by this? We hope to call it the G20 to facilitate long-term technology transfer, ownership of technical know-how, regional and decentralized distributed investment, ownership and manufacturing. These are areas where we require a new multilateral system where we have not only ad hoc and standing technical capacity available to this distributed regional system, we require far greater accountability for who is producing and who gets access. So there are a series of policy instruments. I will not go into all of them here today, but we are debating a series of technical and other guidelines in our task force that will present a way forward for suggesting how distributed data on inequalities on gender, on health, health system strengthening can be much more closely connected to the production imperatives of vaccines, medicines, other therapeutics, diagnostics, where we have seen a great deal of innovation. This may mean, as uh, some of the prior speakers have alluded to, that we need far greater attention to the accountability and governance systems in the multilateral framework that allow us to track and respond to much more localized questions. This is a challenge for global health as we understand it today. And it may mean far greater responsiveness and representation of challenges much closer to where people are experiencing these difficulties. Let me end it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your answer, really complete. Um, let's talk with uh, I can see him, Carlos Regazzoni, the director of the Global Health Committee, the Argentine International Relations Council. Hi, good evening. Or good morning, I don't know. <laughs> so, 
morning. So my question for you is that we know that Latin America is still heavily hit by the pandemic. We, you are in the third wave. Uh, what's your view on the insight and policy recommendation presented so far, especially from the point of view of a Latin America country? Many thanks. It is a pleasure for me to be with you today addressing about global health at the uh, Global Policy Forum. As it has been said, this global pandemic has become the great revealer that post-war institutions need revitalization, that democratic norms cannot be taken for granted, and above all, that we are all in this together. Believe me that from Latin America point perspective, uh, we feel a little bit alone, mostly people uh, among this political turmoil that uh, gives a, a dramatic frame to the pandemic. We, uh, we know that at this moment uh, we are uh, trespassing a, a tremendous uh, a second wave and we have to prepare for the next wave. Uh, we need a comprehensive local health system to exit the, pan the global pandemic. Uh, local health systems are particularly weak here in Latin America. So we face the possibility, the, the, the real possibility of a divided COVID world but uh, countries will differ not only in the incidence of COVID in a, in a COVID divided world, but also in preventable and, tra and treatable chronic as well as communicable diseases, as has been already mentioned. So we have to uh, uh, abide uh, by whatever means possible that divide. And the only uh, uh, solution, that, the only proposal that I can make is to create global health leadership. So my proposal is to create a G20 consistent program to foster international global health leadership, mostly among the poorest nations. If we are going to advance a global health agenda, we need to revitalize global health institutions and to promote global health leaderships, mostly among, among the uh, healthcare workforce. Secondly, you know that uh, uh, to manage the pandemic we need data. So at the same time that Dr. Wen Liang warned of the outbreak in Wuhan, an artificial intelligence algorithm operated by, an, by a Canadian-based company sounded the alarm. So it showed us the future. But uh, I can hardly imagine how difficult it would be to foster an international organization to use uh, in uh, artificial intelligence to detect uh, uh, early in the outbreak and the next pandemia. So my proposal is that we uh, should try to uh, uh, promote such, uh, such kind of institutions using glow, uh, artificial intelligence to promote algorithms to gather information, mostly not only formally as uh, um, it has been said, but also informal information to uh, detect pandemia. The last point is access to medicines and medical technology. It is not a new one. You know, the problem is price. Companies say that the price is needed to attract investment to sustain research. And governments pledge that price is the main cause of inequality of access. Someone must say loud and clear that without lower prices, there is no possibility of expanding access to medicines. There's no solution to this dilemma, but to reduce the price of medicines. So, our proposal is a global regulation for drug pricing. It could inversely tax imports and exports, modify current intellectual property regime, and promote scientific networking to produce cheap medicines. We are not certainly which of the means is better, but we have to reduce the price of medical technology and the price of medicines. Otherwise, a lot of people will not reach their 80s. Let me finish with Dante, Divina Commedia, uh, when the poet says, Nel mezzo del cammino di nostra vita, mi ritrovai per una selva oscura che la dirita via era smarita. I, I hope I pronounced it well. 
in the middle of my ages, I got lost, says Dante, and I had lost the right way, says the poet. This pandemic is the great revealer that we are lost and we need to regain a sense of justice to rediscover the path towards a healthier world. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Director Regazzoni. Thanks to our, our panelists. Unfortunately, we don't have any time for, uh, for more questions from our audience. Hopefully, there will be another chance. Uh, so before we uh, start with the second session of this, uh, with the second panel, I'm sorry, let's just wrap up really quickly. Um, I think it's fair to say that the importance of data is uh, something that everyone is underlining with great emphasis. Um, Mrs. Testori spoke about the uh, importance of data, and so between uh, the proposal, a new independent platform uh, to uh, help researchers to share in a really independent way information and data, of course, um, harmonize data with standardized format and other proposal. And then uh, again, we need, uh, uh, Mrs. Rivas, Srinivas said, we need a new multilateral system uh, to facilitate uh, long-term technology transfer. And uh, last but not least, uh, Mr. Regazzoni, um, and I think is a, um, is a, a alarm from Latin America. They feel, uh, they say we feel alone in this moment. And we, there is a, the threat of a, Co divided COVID world. So his proposal, again, uh, is to create a, a global health leadership inside an uh, instrument inside the G20 to foster a global health agenda. The healthcare system, uh, I think, is something that everyone, uh, again, underlined. So thank you to our panelists for their help. We are learning a little bit late, but I'm sure we can, uh, we can go on with our program. So. Um, um, I will introduce uh, the second panel. The second panel will be on multilateralism. Um, of course, problems with a global dimension are increasingly handled with national borders, thus leading to fragmentation and potential conflict. So in this panel, we are trying to uh, understand, discuss uh, what the way forward can be um, to make sure that multilateralism delivers. So let's start with uh, Ambassador Gian Piero Massolo. He is the lead co-chair of T20 Task Force on Multilateralism, of course, and Global Governance, uh, president of the ESP. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, Ambassador. So um, uh, multilateral solutions in tackling global challenges have been relaunched by the new US President Joe Biden, who saw his mission in Europe in the last uh, week. Um, what are the inside and policy recommendations of the task force on the multi on multilateralism uh, that you chair? Thanks. Good afternoon, Liliana. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Um, seems a little bit more like being in Indianapolis here. It's a car race, much more than a conference. So we will be incredibly speedy. Liliana, I don't envy you. Well, let me first warmly thank uh, all our partners for participating in this extremely enriching adventure, which is the T20. Um, of course, dealing with multilateralism, the first thing uh, to say is that the first month of President Biden showed an encouraging tendency to put again multilateralism and traditional diplomacy at the center of the stage. And uh, now we will see whether uh, deeds will follow words, but at least the, uh, the premises are encouraging. In fact, multilateralism recently looked more like a divisive issue, more than a key tool to address the increasingly complex challenges of the international community. And this also developed an inward loop Booking reflex. And this is the starting point from which the uh, uh, task force on multilateralism started uh, its debates, always having in mind two things. One thing is, is that ineffective multilateralism is not something that we need. And the second assumption was that we need a more inclusive, sustainable, people focused multilateralism. We tended to, in, uh, to sketch out five policy areas in which to formulate policy recommendations. 
One area is uh, multi-stakeholder international cooperation, uh, how to make multilateralism more inclusive. Second one is how to relaunch existing multilateral institutions. Third one is uh, what and how multilateralism is in trade services and investment. The fourth one is social media and civil society engagement. And the fifth one is transparency and anti-corruption. Uh, as far as the first area is considered multi-stakeholder, well, uh, we think actually, and we intend to propose the creation of working groups in order to promote uh, more broad uh, multi-stakeholder involvement. Uh, groups in which think tanks, representative invited agencies from international organizations, activists, scholars could debate and come up with standardized and shareable best practices. And we have in mind two, among others. One is the creation of a T20-driven working group on development cooperation and foreign aid. And the second one would be the establishment of sort of a G20 tech ambassador in order to liaise with internet and technology companies and discuss crucial regulatory and political issues. The second realm that is uh, exi relaunching existing multilateral institutions, um, we think that it would be nice to underline, would be important to underline the costs of global inaction in the face of common challenges. And uh, starting from this viewpoint, we want to call the G20 leaders to set up an open and inclusive platform to share information and evidence of the costs of non-coordination. Maybe having in view also uh, the possibility of developing a comprehensive index on the costs of non-coordination and also elaborating on behalf of the G20 sort of a global risk report in which the T20 could serve as secretariat in order to give the G20 more strategic insight. As well, the third area is considered that is uh, multilateralism in trade, service, and investment. We aim to propose uh, strengthening attention to the elaboration of global legal standards. Actually, uh, one of the problems that we face in the multilateral approach is the proliferation of different views and the fragmentation of global economy. And so maybe to stress the role of rules, maybe to stress the, yeah, the role of global standards could have a name here. And this applies also to such innovative fields like, for instance, cryptocurrencies. In the field of social media and civil society engagement, well, here, of course, we are speaking and dealing with fake news, disinformation, and things like this. And actually, uh, we suggest the creation of the G20 communication office responsible for developing a comprehensive communication strategy. And last, the transparency and international anti-corruption fight, uh, we suggest a new approach. And this approach is risk-based. That is sort of a uh, making people feel that if I, they are not transparent, they are actually not abiding to anti-corruption fights and norms, they pay a price. And this kind of risk, uh, we think and we hope that could be better effective than uh, some other approaches that have been in fashion until today. So those very broadly are the orientations, the policy orientations and the policy fits in which Task Force on Multilateralism uh, developed its roles. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Um, so now um, I will give the floor to Rose Nguji, co-chair of the T20 Task Force on Multilateralism and Global Governance and the Executive Director of Kipra from Kenya. Uh, good morning. Uh, my question for you uh, will be what, what, the, what steps do you think should be taken to achieve a more inclusive, multi-stakeholder multi international cooperation, which takes into account the interest of low-income countries? The floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, it's appreciate uh, uh, having been invited in this forum and also to support uh, uh, what my chair has uh, indicated as far as multilateralism is concerned. And for me, I have uh, only three, three elements that I want to bring in. 
and more so on the issues of uh, inclusiveness, uh, especially for the low income countries and also uh, thinking about uh, the African uh, uh, multilateralism in the context of uh, the global uh, uh, multilateralism. So in uh, addition to what uh, the chair has indicated, I, I think it's important uh, really to look at uh, what is going on in Africa. The African Union uh, is actually uh, strengthening its structures. Uh, it, is, it is having, for example, uh, a blueprint development, uh, a, a development blueprint. It is also has come up with uh, you know, a continental free trade area. And there are many other institutional structures that have been formed. And I believe that uh, this aspect of having a, a rotational kind of invitation to the G20 may actually not uh, provide uh, the continuity in discussion of the issues that uh, face the region. And for that reason, uh, 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 I think it's a very, very crucial that uh, we rethink uh, uh, incorporating AU as a, as a permanent member or any type of membership uh, so that uh, the issues of uh, uh, developing countries, uh, more so the low-income countries, can actually be addressed in such a forum. Secondly, uh, is uh, when we look at uh, the G20 plan. Uh, when in 2015, Albright, uh, Gabari, when they were proposing this, they were indicating that it's important to have the G20 plus, which has uh, the UN and the Britain World Institutions. But when you think about the Britain World Institutions, where the low income countries are actually represented, they still don't have a, a voice. Uh, these are institutions that are quarter based. And for that reason, uh, even when you talk about uh, special drawing rights uh, and you do them as per the quarter, the kind of uh, shares that they would have uh, will still be very, very small. So any other way of uh, supporting the low-income countries, uh, even in the context of the G20+, plus, uh, then becomes uh, very, very crucial. Uh, and then finally is uh, the aspect of involving uh, uh, think tanks. I like the aspect of the, world, uh, the working group that is uh, being proposed. But the key element that... Um, would come to, to, to distinguish it from uh, these other forums and making it more legitimate forum is uh, having representation again from low income, in, income countries because that's the only point that uh, we can have uh, uh, discussions uh, and bring in evidence uh, from uh, the region which can actually be taken up to the, the G20 uh, uh, platform. So as we think about uh, the region and the think tanks, it's important that to remember that uh, uh, in most, most of the times uh, they may not get involved uh, too much on the G20 uh, issues because uh, uh, the multilateral issues may not be very well covered by these uh, think tanks. So understanding actually the process of uh, uh, multilateralism for these uh, institutions becomes uh, uh, a big uh, element in uh, uh, pushing uh, the legitimate uh, forum uh, forward. Uh, in addition, uh, is also to say that um, when we look at uh, uh, the alliance uh, of the alliance multilateralism, uh, whereby at the moment, as I was looking at the data, is representing about 15 countries in Africa. You realize that uh, the proposal that has been put there is for G20 to take uh, leadership. So when uh, we think about uh, legitimate uh, uh, platforms, and this one is an alternative uh, uh, platform then you'll notice that uh, we are yet actually to get there as far as uh, having legitimate uh, uh, forum uh, to represent uh, uh, the low income country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director. Thanks to you. Uh, my last uh, panelist, our last panelist will be uh, Mr. Wang Dong, Deputy Director and, and Executive Director as well of the Institute for Global Cooperation and Understanding from the Peking University in China. Hello, good evening. Uh, Thanks for being with us. Uh, so my question for you is quite easy. What, in your, from your point of view, what's your view uh, from Beijing on the future of multilateralism and multilateral efforts? Thank you, thank you. Um, it is my honor uh, to be part of this uh, very important dialogue. Uh, and I've learned a lot from uh, the, the uh, presentations of this uh, two uh, 
uh, uh, uh, G20 uh, report on uh, multilateralism. Uh, I think a lot of uh, the recommendations made in this report are very important. Um, in the five minutes I have, I will be. I would like to very quickly um, present a, a Chinese view uh, of multilateralism. First of all, I would say that uh, China actually has been uh, quite actively uh, practicing multilateral diplomacy uh, at both regional and international levels. Uh, and uh, over the years, China actually has been, uh, for, for example, China has been uh, for many years the largest uh, uh, contributor to uh, the UN peacekeeping operations among the five permanent, uh, permanent members of the UN Security Council. And China is also uh, one of the most uh, uh, active uh, participants uh, of the international counter piracy operations uh, out of the uh, 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 Gulf of Coast of uh, Gulf of Belt. Uh, and of course, China also has been uh, very active uh, in uh, advocating and also supporting the G20 uh, framework. Uh, and of course, China is also among uh, the leaders of the global effort to combat uh, climate change, uh, just to uh, name a few. Uh, at the core of China's uh, multilateral diplomacy, uh, actually is uh, the United Nations. Uh, the United Nations, the Chinese among, I would say China is among the staunchest supporter of the international system uh, anchor on the United Nations. And China actually act, uh, advocates that uh, the true multilateralism should be inclusive. Uh, the point, a point I think has been uh, uh, just been uh, brought up by uh, 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 other two uh, uh, panelists. And I think uh, rather than exclusive. And uh, I think this uh, uh, such an emphasis is very important uh, because some, uh, to be very honest, I think some uh, Western countries uh, talking about uh, multilateralism, however, uh, that is actually exclusive in nature and the broad competition sort of in disguise. Um, and also uh, buttressed by a highly ideological narrative uh, that is reminiscent, uh, reminiscent of the Cold War. Uh, I would say that is not uh, true multilateralism. Uh, that is uh, um, uh, actually risks uh, a new Cold War. Uh, so also for that matter, I think it's very important to uh, stress that, um, that the rules-based international order a concept that has been frequently uh, used by politicians uh, around the world. Uh, but what kind of uh, the, the rules? I think the rules should actually be the international rules uh, uh, that uh, have the UN Charter and the international law uh, at its core, rather than the rules of a small category of uh, countries. So last point I would like to make is that uh, China's multilateral uh, diplomacy is also aimed at uh, maintaining and defending the existing international order uh, that has the United Nations uh, at its core, and also to uh, making sure the existing international order uh, is just and reasonable. Uh, uh, that is also uh, uh, conducive to the protection and defending of the interest of uh, developing countries. Uh, so I think that uh, I, I would argue uh, uh, represents uh, the most um, uh, the, the most important views are from Beijing's uh, uh, perspective uh, on multilateralism. Um, and uh, I lastly just let me to say that I very much agree with uh, a lot of the uh, recommendations made uh, by Ambassador uh, Maslow uh, in uh, his uh, presentation, uh, the uh, including uh, the ones to uh, uh, to try to create a. Uh, how to defend a, I think, a true multilateral free trading system. Uh, a lot of challenge, a lot of, you know, disagreement uh, on the international stage. However, I think we, it is very important for us to really to refrain from, uh, from having politics, I think, trumps, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the real debate or, or science, uh, so to speak, and which is also a, a very important, uh, the, the global challenge, the current COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, is facing us. Another global challenge, I think, requires uh, a global effort uh, together. So, so how to do that is very important, I think, for all of us to, uh, to structure, uh, I think, a, 
healthy balance between politics uh, and science and uh, and help facilitate a general dialogue and uh, and uh, and a collaborative in global efforts uh, uh, in that regard um, so i think my time uh, is up and uh, and i will I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wang. But uh, talking about China, I have a question about it because we have some time, incredibly. Uh, we have a question from Colin Bradford from the uh, Brookings um, program. Um, uh, the question is, uh, do you think it's possible and how is it possible, how could it be possible to include China in global leadership while keeping the international system whole and singular and not a polarized or bipolar one? Do you think it would be possible and how? Um, I actually recently, uh, you know, risk uh, self-promoting. Uh, I actually just uh, recently published uh, an article in Foreign Affairs uh, where I present a Chinese vision of the evolving global order, uh, in which I argue that a new engagement consensus actually is needed. Um, and of course, it is based on the critique of the old engagement consensus, so to speak, uh, 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 which uh, the American, you know, uh, largely shared by uh, the American uh, bipartisan consensus uh, in the United States over the past few decades. Um, I think the real problem of that old engagement consensus is that this idea uh, they wanted to, quote unquote, transform uh, China, to change China to lead China into a US-led international order. And I think that uh, uh, presumption is fundamentally fraught uh, from the very beginning, uh, because China is, is not as a, a, an ancient uh, civilization of 5,000 years. It's not a, uh, you know, a, a, a country that is to be transformed and, and to be educated and to be led by on the United States into the international order. So um, what I argue in that article is that I try to combine uh, the idea uh, of, the, uh, of the responsible stakeholder uh, of the Bob Zolik uh, and also the G2 idea of uh, Dr. Brzezinski. Try to merge these two ideas together. I would, uh, I would like to argue that uh, China and the United States as uh, the two pillars uh, among appears of uh, of multilateral uh, uh, multi stakeholders, uh, they should uh, work together uh, instead of engaging in uh, a strategic competition that is uh, unlimited. There should be a limit to um, the the competition between China and the United States, and they should also work together try to. Uh, strive for what I call it a G2 RS, uh, a group of two uh, responsible stakeholders, along with other uh, uh, state international stakeholders, try to um, try to I think work for a uh, future global order uh, that is I think more justice and more reasonable and uh, beneficial to all countries to all uh, stakeholders. Thank you, Dr. Wang, Ambassador Masolo, do you think it would be possible with this? Um, a new administration with Biden administration to write a new chapter of the China-US relationship? I do hope so. Uh, there is a, uh, a framework. The G20 can offer a good framework of what uh, Dr. Wang was just saying, that is uh, two actors that are a little bit more key than the others, but also a framework and the G20 could, could actually uh, be a good format in order to exercise both restraint and responsibility in uh, managing world affairs. We will see, uh, actually, uh, it is not indifferent how deeds will follow towards uh, both in the United States and in China, by the way. And uh, as Europeans, we hope uh, that uh, uh, the word will not be decoupled because a decoupled word would be uh, contrary to the basic interests of our peoples. Very much. Thank you, Ambassador Massolo. Thank you to all our panelists. Um, I will do a quite short to wrap up and then we go straight to the panel three, migration. So thank you to everybody.
So about multilateralism, we got a lot of proposal, the creation of working groups in which the uh, different think tank and agencies can debate, uh, for instance, the G20 tech ambassador or the G20. And again, uh, we should have a G20 communication office, um, a new approach to fight corruption. Um, I, again, Dr. Nguji, uh, underline the importance of inclusiveness when we talk about Africa. And, uh, and she underlined something really real. She need, we need, as a, as a continent, we need the continuity. So maybe a membership for the African Union and improve, again, also the um, think tank in the, in the continent. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Wang about China and the future relationship in the multilateral system and relationship with the US and not, not just with the US. Uh, he, he suggests that we can go uh, toward a two responsible stakeholder system, the United States and China. Let's see what will happen in the bilateral relationship, but uh, in, the framework, in the framework, sorry, of the multilateralism, of course. Um, but he, he, he underlined that multilateralism should be inclusive rather than exclusive and should not be ideological. This is the point of view from China, and then we go straight to the panel three migration. Uh, of course, we are uh, at the edge of the, um, on the day before the European Council will uh, address once again migration. And COVID-19, of course, has contributed to reshape migration flows further endangering migrants' lives because um, at movement restriction and border closure. Uh, in this part of the session, we will ask our panelists what strategies can be designed from developing social protection strategy for asylum seekers to supporting women's empowerment and fighting people's exploitation. And I'm really glad to um, present our next panelist, uh, Emma, Emma Bonino, lead co-chair of T20 TF10 on migration and senator of the Itali Italian Republic. Good afternoon. I, we cannot hear you, if you can unmute. Um, and my question for you is, uh, so as the pandemic is losing its grip on some part of the world, as we know, migratory flows are getting back on the global agenda. What to recommend to G20 leaders? Mrs. Bonino, Senator, to you. Uh, the, the first thing, thing I would recognize is for everybody to accept that migration for any reasons, uh, repression, poverty, uh, drought, um, inundation, etc., etc., is a structural element of humanity since many, many years. And in no country, to my knowledge, the acceptance of foreigners uh, and the migrants has been without problems, at least in the first generation. Then when children uh, uh, go to school, integration begins. But the point is that there is no miracle solution and every mm, effort to stop people from moving is simply uh, a non-starter. Hmm? Now, uh, that is, uh, goes with all the G20, in particular it goes to my country uh, and uh, to Europe. That in Europe, uh, member states will address again and again uh, this issue uh, uh, on the incoming summit of uh, Thursday and uh, Friday. Um, the, the question is first to stop them there with some agreement for repatriation. But the question is that our interests are not the interest of uh, the incoming uh, of the country of origin. Country of origin, particularly if I mean uh, Africa in general, but Asia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, et cetera, et cetera, they are experiencing, experiencing a real boom in childbirth. Europe is becoming older and older. So in principle, there should be some room for finding 
uh, a, a sort of a equilibrium between uh, us and quote unquote them. In fact, for many reasons, mostly political reasons, this theme in many countries of Europe, uh, uh, not only Italy, uh, has become uh, very, very controversial and very politicized. So we, many people here don't even accept that moving uh, is a personal right. That has always been like that. Uh, um, even Italy, we had more than 20 million emigrants in between the two world wars. So we should have some experience. You cannot stop people. They are not tree with roots, etc. They are like, like fish. They move. And they move where life can be better. If we accept this principle or this reality, then we will try, we can try to integrate them. And here also is a complex, really complex uh, appeal uh, fight or goal. But I don't see anything else, if not letting everybody um, buried in the Mediterranean or in the Atlantic or whatever it is. Now, the, the, the fact is that even that principle that people move whatever you say hmm, is not accepted, uh, culturally and politically speaking. And the country of origin are normally experiencing uh, um, a boom uh, in birth rates, as I said, and on top of that, the, the more the people go, the more they get re remittances from the immigrants. So their interest is not like ours, and that's why it's difficult, a part of demagogic or uh, electoral reason, uh, try to find a, a common ground. Thanks a lot, and let's talk with, um, give the floor to Elena Sanchez Montuano. She's the co chair of T20 TF10 on migration, a research professor uh, from Mexico. Good afternoon, good morning. Uh, my question for you is uh, uh, the number of forcibly displaced people keeps increasing, even during the pandemic. Better data on migration flows could help tackle this issue. Uh, Dr. Sanchez, what does your task force have to say to the G20 at this respect? The floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be part of this forum to represent the task force on migration in this event. Uh, before I focus on answering this specific question, let me start remarking that any recommendation on migration should be developed under the most relevant intergovernmental agreement on this topic which cover all dimensions of international migration in a holistic and comprehensive manner. These, these main uh, agreements are the Global Compact for Migration and the Global Compact on Refugees, approved both in 2018 in the framework of the Revolution. Following uh, the reality of migration as explained by Senator Bonino, people move and keeping in mind both agreements, I want to focus in, on, on three main policy areas. Uh, the, first that, the, the first one is data, and it's also uh, it's very similar, or it's, we have something in common with the first panel on, on health. Uh, the, the second one is about the refugees community and their vulnerabilities, and the third one is about diaspora and root cases. Instead, starting with data, data on international migration are far from being sufficient and precise. On the one hand, it's almost impossible to forecast how many people will arrive from one country to another, neither in the short nor long term. On the other hand, there is a lack of information regarding people who are already in a particular destination country, their demographic characteristics and their needs. Although for more than 20 years, national and international institutions have been continuously working on improving data collection and quality of the estimates, there is still a lot of work to do. 
the lack of data impacts negatively to the demographic analysis of the population chain and increase the uncertainty of population estimates and projection. Investing in collecting data in, in predictive tools will allow an efficient global governance where all the stakeholder, stakeholders can react to the migrant phenomenon and to make prudent, prudent and robust decisions. Otherwise, otherwise, we will be making blinded policy decisions. The second recommendation will be focused on the refugee communities, in particular, as Senator Bonino has mentioned, in, in integration. As, as everybody knows, uh, refugee communities nowadays, the most vulnerable migrant groups, we are talking about uh, 82 4 point million persons who are in this situation. And, and, and as, as, we, as we know, uh, if we take in the, in, into account the global contact, but the global compact, but particularly the, the Refugee Convention of 1951, destination societies should do their best to address their vulnerabilities. Um, in this regard, I think that we must focus in, in three main topics. The first one is related to the labor market and the integration of these uh, communities in, 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 our, in, in our societies. Um, in the task force, we mentioned that uh, it seems um, very important to, to the use of technology, including matching algorithms, which would help to balance labor market supply and demand. Um, the second uh, point that I would like to remark uh, is related with uh, developing social projection strategies. And uh, here we can focus in education, health, and, and, and housing. Uh, something that seems very important to us is um, enforce collaborative programs between the private sectors, NGOs, and local authorities to improve the provision and access to education. Um, I, I would like to remind here, uh, as a few weeks ago, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris reminded the Guatemala and Mexican government the need to support and cooperate with non-governmental organizations without interferences. And the third uh, topic that is really important uh, with integration and, and refugee community is uh, the, the situation of the, of the vaccines. Vaccination coverage for refugees and migrants in general must be improved. Uh, in, in, our, in our task force, we are mentioning about uh, the, the need to support from G20 uh, COVAX. We seem to the global collabor collaboration to accelerate development, production, equitable access to COVID-19 tests, treatment, and vaccines. Let me finish with the third recommendation that is related with diaspora report cases. Here, uh, as I don't have much time, um, let me just mention one example that is uh, related with the, with the European Commission. As many of you know, a few weeks ago, uh, it was approved a project entitled Talent Partnership. So in this kind of project, we think that we can develop the situation of, of, of the migrants in terms of the mobility, the flows, but also in terms of a development in, in origin countries. So I live here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And now let me give the floor to Youssef Chahed, former Prime Minister from Tunisia. Um, as a former Prime Minister of a country which is at the heart uh, of the Mediterranean, uh, what is your view on international efforts to tackle migration? The floor is yours. I'm unfortunately not the former prime minister. My fault, my bad. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, uh, deeply honored to attend this uh, conference and I would like to thank the organizer for the invitation. Uh, also, I heard the recommendation and I find them very interesting, very useful and uh, I'm sure uh, they will ensure progress in migration and integration policies. Uh, promoting labor market integration, uh, securing the health and safety of migrants, or ensuring access to education are key priorities in improving resilience of integration system for refugees and other migrants 
And generally speaking, early intervention policies are crucial uh, for uh, successful uh, integration. Now, I believe that the main point that can have impact on the implementation of this recommendation in the next coming months uh, and on the migration issue in general is, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the pandemic um, already, uh, I mean, the pandemic already strongly impacted migration. 2020 appears as an historical law for international immigration and the economic consequences of the pandemic will certainly impact tomorrow and future challenges. Uh, and it will also orient future international effort, at least in the next coming months. And we need here to have some lesson learned in terms of threats of, and opportunities from the COVID crisis in relation with the mig migration issue. Uh, COVID-19 has with no doubt aggravated disparities for migrant population and increased poverty and unemployment for many migrants and their families. Uh, migrants were among the worst hit by the virus. Uh, there was in many countries an unequal access to testing and to the vaccines. And this was, by the way, rightly addressed in the uh, preliminary finding we, uh, we had. Uh, and this make this proposal of crucial importance. Um, also, these integration policies on migration will require funds, uh, will require public spending that may become, again, because of the COVID economic impact, much more difficult to find. So, uh, actually, it is clear that the pandemic has created many new challenges for the world, and it is expected that policymakers' attention and country agendas may be focused in the next period more on other important and strategic uh, domestic issue, issue than on migration. Uh, and we saw that, for example, uh, in 2020, refugee crisis around the globe received less attention, to be honest. Uh, so I believe that the main threat currently is, uh, um, uh, and let's say that the global interest uh, on migration issue may be wiped out by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, based on that, I believe that G20 and other international efforts needs to pay attention and consider seriously these risks. And that's why the G20 needs in the next period to start by reaffirming that migration issue. Uh, and I am happy to, 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 hear, to hear that, that migration issue is a crucial question and ensuring with the active contribution of all stakeholders and civil society that migration issue will remain at the center of the debate despite the pandemic challenges. Uh, and to help that, it is essential to highlight the role of migrants during the COVID-19 pandemic. It was an essential role, uh, and the pandemic showed to which extent the global economy is relying on migrant labor uh, in healthcare services or in maintaining the food supply chain. Uh, and this uh, was true not only in low-skilled jobs. We saw the role of migrants as a essential worker or frontline workers in also high-skilled jobs such as a doctor or a physician. So again, uh, it is crucial to reiterate the need for migrant and migration, including as part of the COVID-19 recovery plans as countries started to uh, rebuild their economy after uh, the, the crisis. Uh, and then here, I would like to mention that there is a risk that travel restriction and border closure are pronged beyond what is necessary for preventing the spread of the virus, which will impact strongly the migration, like in 2020. Um, and here it is worth to note that travel restriction impacted legal immigration, but also illegal immigration, including change to informal migration routes. For example, the, the number of illegal border crossing along the EU border fell uh, by 15% in 2020, of course, largely because of the impact of COVID-19 restriction. This was probably the lowest number in the last 10 years. However, in 2021 and since the beginning of May, thanks to uh, relaxed corona rules and also the good weather condition, uh, the number of boat arrivals on the Mediterranean routes has climbed sharply, reaching almost six or seven times uh, as many as before corona in 2019. And of course, we need to pay also attention uh, to that. In summary, I believe that the pandemic will have significant effect on migration. It will create economic and 
societal transformation with threats and opportunities on migration. Um, uh, it will probably increase in employment and more important, it will change the skills needed, uh, the skills needs by migration countries. Uh, inequalities will also rise with increasing pressure on public finance. Uh, that's why I think we need to prepare for these changes. Um, that's why I think we need to anticipate them uh, and to look for the necessary funding uh, in order to better respond to future migration challenges. Thank you. Thank Thanks to you. Thanks to you, uh, Mr. Chad. Uh, Chad, I'm still um, I'm sorry for my uh, misunderstanding before now, so I can give the floor to Lato Yawaha, Analysis and Consulting, Migration and Flight, Conrad Adenauer Foundation. Um, my question for you uh, is, while migration flows are on the rise again in the Mediterranean, what are your comments on the recommendations presented so far? Well, thank you for your question and thank you also for the great opportunity to provide my comments in such a high profile panel and event. I would like to share three observations relating to your question and based on these observations would like to comment on three recommendations made by the task force. Before I start, I would like to highlight that migration comes with many opportunities, but also with many risks for all agents involved, for sending countries, for receiving countries, and for the migrants themselves. The first observation uh, relates to a study by our regional program in the Mediterranean, which shows that large parts of the younger population in the region are willing to migrate elsewhere, particularly to the European Union. And while some members of the sending country societies benefit from migration, for example, by migrants' remittances, the overall society loses by losing the people they invested in through education, be it vocational training, school or university education. And this is not only considered a brain drain, but also a skill and strength drain. And this partly leads to resentment against destination countries, which benefit from the sending countries' investments. The second observation is that destination countries worldwide witness the increasing political and social challenges of migration and also of the needed integration of migrations into not only the labor market, but also on the long and medium run into the state, the welfare and the society. And these challenges increasingly lead citizens to question the benefits of migration and unfortunately, as a result, also to question the asylum system, a development we need to counter also in order to uphold the stability and peace within the receiving countries themselves. The third ob observation relates to um, migrants and refugees who are at risk themselves. Smuggling networks often promise a great future elsewhere, but frequently they turn smuggling into trafficking, selling migrants, men, women and children into exploitative situations along the route and in destination countries. Hence, we need a migration system that allows for an equilibrium of interests of those involved. And I think the following three recommendations made by the task force can contribute to that. The first recommendation I would like to refer to is devising new policy tools such as the skill mobility partnerships to enable countries of origin and destination to reap the benefits of circular migration. The implementation of this recommendation would allow both receiving and sending countries to benefit from the migrant skills and the investment of both countries into the migrants. It can further the exchange of knowledge and in this context can even trigger innovation in both countries. And at the same time, it could increase the mutual understanding and that migrants can serve as cultural brokers without the need of the permanent integration. So I think this task force suggestion could increase the acceptance of migration in both countries, in the countries of origin and destination. The second recommendation relates to the supporting return network, uh, return migration networks as key elements of the post-pandemic development strategies. The pandemic has challenged states, economies, and societies worldwide. There will be a race back to the normal, and skills and knowledge will be key in achieving that. So receiving countries cannot deprive the sending countries of their human capital. Instead, they should support migrants to return home for them to be able to contribute to their home country's recovery. 
The implementation of this recommendation can increase the stability in the countries of origin and all agents, sending countries, receiving countries and the migrants themselves can benefit significantly from this recommendation. The third recommendation um, is addressing female migrants' vulnerabilities. And I think this recommendation touches upon a very, very important point, namely that of forced labor and trafficking in human beings, or to put it differently, of modern day slavery. Establishing standard contracts as recommended indeed can improve the situation of legal migrants. But trafficking in human beings often links to smuggling of migrants relates to irregular migration and illegal visa overstay. And that means to those who might not benefit to the from the contracts. So reducing the vulnerabilities of migrants and in this context also of refugees also require decisive action against smuggling networks. This um, recommendation I mentioned also suggests searching for regional and multilateral solutions. And I would like to fully support this recommendation and to build on it as a conclusion. Migration takes place globally and is by nature a transnational phenomenon. Only together and only multilaterally and only by taking the diverse interests into account can we come to a sustainable solution from which all agents can benefit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Latoya Waha. Um, I guess we have time for uh, at least one question. And I got one question from Linger Muslim Baye, senior research economist from the African Development Bank. And I guess it's for the former prime minister of Tunisia. The question is, uh, what could be done to allow for a greater appropriation of migration policies in countries of origin? The floor is yours. Yes, uh, uh, what needs to be done is that countries of origin always, uh, this is to be honest with you, need not their priority. We have, I mean, I can talk for those countries, a uh, huge economic issue, and now plus the coronavirus uh, economic uh, issues, the debt issue, etc. So um, uh, I think we need a better uh, debate with, uh, for example, uh, European countries. Uh, we need to find the good framework to discuss that. Always uh, EU policies, for example, related to migration um, are uh, unilateral uh, policies. There is no implication of countries of uh, South Mediterranean uh, countries, for example. And many times, to be honest, we, we heard about those policies uh, in media or uh, uh, according to diplomatic channels. I mean, we're not involved enough in the discussion of those policies. Sometimes we heard that there is, for example, uh, refugee camps in North African countries, uh, but there is no uh, previous debate. There is no previous concertation. So I, I think that we need to have better concertation on those issues. Uh, we need to find the, the, the good framework to discuss that. Uh, and probably to link it with other uh, cooperation tools with uh, developed countries. So uh, th there is not enough debates in order to discuss those issues. We, to, I I'll be honest, we, uh, we, 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 re we remember these uh, migration challenges uh, mainly when there is uh, election in EU or when there is a drama in North African countries when, for example, an illegal boat uh, in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, uh, and we, we saw a lot of drama like that. So uh, I, I think we need really to create this framework to discuss between policymakers in the North area and in the South area about this issue and put the, the funding for that because uh, this is an important issue. And, uh, and now the, the South the African countries are really fighting with the economic consequences of the corona um, debt to GDP ratio uh, increased, I mean, in all those countries and uh, uh, those countries has not access to quantitative easing tools like the developed world. So uh, they, they, they are really facing uh, huge pressure, uh, economic pressure that make them um, less, uh, I mean, less uh, attention and less focus on the migration issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, building up on what you just said, I would like to ask to Senator 
uh, Senator Bonino, as a former member of our government, of the Italian government, as a, and as a former member of the European Commission. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, Senator, uh, do you trust the G20 to be the good forum where talk about migration and where to find common policies, or do you trust more the European Union uh, at least as a I, how can I say, as a, the good forum in, in theory, then in the practice everything is quite different. What do you think? Where, where, where should we address this, this, this issue? What I do think, uh, and I share uh, very much the, the um, remarks by our colleague uh, Youssef uh, Shahid, um, is that uh, the issue is so important from many points of view, uh, it's so complex, that uh, every possibility of discussing previously uh, any decision that everybody can take um, is of essence. So G20 is a useful framework, but it's also there are others that should be involved. Um, we tend in Europe to decide uh, ourselves uh, with a lot of contrast, by the way, um, and then propose our solution to our colleague uh, in Africa. I don't think it can uh, work like that anymore. Um, if you want a partnership, you have to, uh, to consider them partners. It's not that simply you travel to Tunisia, in this case, or others, proposing our solution, uh, which, by the way, comes simply to a point, keep your people. That's the point. This is uh, what uh, we are traveling and saying, uh, and bilateral, and then uh, say, yeah, we will invest more, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in the meantime, please keep your people, because for us, uh, they are a problem, a political problem, an electoral problem, a, a social problem, but without realizing that our partner uh, from the South, uh, even in Mexico, wherever, have other priorities. Their priorities, as Youssef said very clearly, is a completely another priority, the problem of uh, uh, the question uh, public debt, development, etc., etc. We will take time, but in the meantime, they are not in a position to stop their people, even if they try, but that is not viable. So I think that G20 uh, is a good opportunity we shouldn't miss. We should not miss, at least in deciding that uh, before deciding anything for us, uh, we share, let's say, some consultation uh, with uh, others at the regional forum, international forum, uh, general assembly forum, everywhere, every possible venue, uh, except the bilateral, mm -hmm. um, because this problem is also, at least I'm speaking out of European experience, a very controversial inside Europe. Hmm? There is a lot of competition inside Europe. Uh, uh, and so uh, normally bilateral visit, visits are not well co coordinated and every minister goes on his own or on his own country uh, interest. So, I, finally, uh, I wanted also to share the very important points made by uh, Waha uh, on women and children. Hmm? Uh, this is also something that is not uh, thought about uh, as it need, should be. Um, in any case, let's take the opportunity of the G20 at least to establish that partnership means partnership. Doesn't mean I decide a new forum. That simply doesn't work. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. And I think this is something we can, uh, it's like a fil rouge in the three panel of this uh, first session, uh, quoting Dr. Wang from the former panel, Multilateral, multilateralism should be inclusive and, uh, and not ex exclusive. So thank you to our panelists. Uh, thanks uh, to being with us for, um, to our audience. I should say that we can sum up uh, our conversation saying that the importance of data and of, as I, as I say, multilateralism is something that uh, G20 should be able to address and that uh, talking about uh, migration as uh, um, Senator Bonino just said is a structural moment and we must find uh, a balance. There is not a miracle solution and integration is the key. Thanks to everybody. Now uh, I will ask our audience to stay with us because now we get, I will give the floor to session number two, global policy proposal for the planet, climate, energy and sustainable infrastructure. And uh, thank you for being with us in this uh, long afternoon. And um, I think we can give the floor to uh, our colleague. morning, uh, evening or afternoon, everybody. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the second session of the Global Policy Forum on behalf uh, also of the International Affairs Institute, uh, Institute Affairs Internationali, which has cooperated on the organization of this event uh, as co-chair of THINK20. Uh, I think the first session has already shed uh, much light on a number of uh, crucial issues related to the general heading uh, of people, which is, as you know, one of the three headings chosen by the I I Italian presidency of G20, including uh, health, uh, multilateralism and migration. This session will address uh, a not less uh, uh, large uh, spectrum of issues that fall under the heading of planet, which is another heading uh, identified by the Italian presidency. And of course, uh, this very large heading uh, include uh, um, the challenge of climate change, uh, the crucial issues of energy transition and uh, infrastructure uh, sustainability, the way uh, in which uh, uh, the competent bodies, including G20, can promote uh, a, a greater sustainability of infrastructure and also uh, <clears throat> encourage a new form of investment. Uh, this session will be opened by uh, the keynote speeches of two leading figures, uh, Jose Luis Chicoma, Minister of Production of Peru, and Vivian Foster, Chief Economist of the uh, infrastructure vice presidency of the of the, of the World Bank. Uh, I the, both of them will have uh, uh, about six uh, minutes, and uh, I would first uh, ask uh, Mr. Chikoma if uh, he would like to share his thought about, uh, in particular, the specific role that the G20 can play in uh, advancing uh, the, uh, the fight against climate change, but also in promoting new model of uh, sustainable development. And also, if uh, he can also speak about uh, the role that the think tanks and civil organization group uh, can have in uh, also helping this effort uh, to promote uh, a, a new sustainable development agenda, in particular on the <laughs> problem of green transition and the, the fight against uh, climate change. Please, we have the floor. 
Thank you very much and good morning and good afternoon to you all. Special greetings to Vivian Foster, Chief Economist for the Infrastructure, Vice President of the World Bank, Ettore Greco, Executive Vice President of the Instituto Fari International from Italy, Paolo Magri, Executive Vice President of ISPI, James Magan, Director of the Think Tanks and Civil Society Program. Well, as many of you know, I worked in think tanks for many years, researching, developing, and promoting proposals for sustainable development in Mexico and Latin America. I have on many occasions crossed the divide between promoter of ideas and passionate advocate of the urgent measures needed to save our planet. And I have frequently become impatient with the sluggishness of the authorities when it comes to taking decisive measures that could tip the balance in the fight against climate change. I have also taken an active part in international forums such as this one in which we learn from the experiences of our peers in other countries and regions many of them facing similar challenges when fundraising, communicating our proposals more effectively, and increasing our impact on decision makers. These forums also provide a collective catharsis for our fears, frustrations, and hopes. Now I'm on the other side as Peru's Minister of Production in a transition government that is ending in a little bit more than a month. I stepped into this role last November in the midst of the worst political crisis in recent decades, the result of a conflict that brought record numbers of Peruvians onto the streets to defend democracy. But the political crisis was only one of several historical challenges our transitional government faced amid what amounted to a perfect storm marked by an unprecedented collapse of the health system, a catastrophic economic fallout, as well as a social crisis in a country riven by conflicts. And from this position, I'm still impatient to see what measures we are taking as countries and globally to combat climate change and save the planet. Because of course, in Peru and large parts of the world, we are overwhelmed by crisis, by the pandemic, as well as by structural problems with our political and economic systems. However, the approaching climate crisis will eclipse everything we are currently experiencing, even though these have been some of the most difficult years in recent human history. Hence the importance of the G20 and the leadership provided by organizations such as the Think Tanks and Civil Society Program, uh, and ISPI, so that at the T20 we can emphasize what we can do together to meet the urgent needs of our planet. It is impossible to minimize the G20's global role. As we all know, the G20 brings together the world's major economies, accounting for more than 80% of GDP, 75% of global trade, and 60% of the population of the planet. Thus, the decisions and policies adopted by the members of this group are of great importance because of the worldwide impact. Even though it's a forum of informal international governance, the decisions and actions taken by this group influence state decision makers and in turn, public policies and regulations in countries around the world. And the G20, and also with its links to the, G, to the B20, to the C20, and obviously the T20, has several ideal forums in which to display the perspectives of the different stakeholder groups. From a more scientific point of view, the analysis made by groups such as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change have been fundamental. The reports on climate change, land, oceans, and, and, and many other issues must form the foundations for discussion of any coherent public policy proposal on these subjects. The same applies to the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, and the forthcoming conclusions and, and recommendations from the UN Food System Summit on Biodiversity and Food to mention two issues among many which are fu fundamental to combating climate change. Indeed, these climate change proposals have created a need for reforms that will have to develop quicker than governments can gain expertise, as we are hampered by bureaucracies not deigned to generate cutting ed edge me measures in a, in a faster way. Every proposal nowadays has to be green and include a climate change component. 
the finance ministry, the production ministry, and many other ministries that are related more with the, uh, with the economic side of the equation um, have to work closer than never with the ministries of the environment. This policy crossroads generates more potential impacts for the think tank community. Today, we need think tanks more than ever for our science, technology, and innovation policies need to be changed to be green and sustainable. Our economic growth targets need to also change to be policies for sustainable growth. All of our programs of post-COVID economic reactivation programs have to promote a sustainable reactivation. For that, we need knowledge and concrete proposals based on clearly demonstrable facts and institutions with transparent financing so that we know who they really represent so that there are no conflicts of interest. Our think tanks must rise to the challenge of fighting climate change without funding from those opposed to such a challenge and free from the influence of those who would use them as an additional tool in their greenwashing strategies. The think tanks policies of independence, transparency, and high quality research are more important than ever to ensure that politicians and decision makers listen to those who combine expertise and legitimate representation of the public interest and of society as a whole. They can thus work together to mobilize intellectual, financial, and communications resources and build coalitions, both national and international, and thus have a greater impact on decision makers and politicians. I would like to end by reflecting on what I learned from you when I was part of your world of think tanks, which was how to be creative to have a bigger impact on policy. As we have always said, technical knowledge and expertise is a necessary foundation for having an impact, but it's not everything. Just as important are the soft skills of influencing, persuasion, storytelling, and the construction of attractive and consistent narrative that transcend the technical to unite politics with a more human dimension. Thus, you will have the year not only of those of us who are decision makers, but also of the general public, and this will magnify your impact. I would like to thank Paolo Magri and Jim Magan for giving me the opportunity to talk with you, a community for which I have a great deal of admiration and with which I will always remain in contact to drive our common goal of promoting sustainable development throughout the world. Thank you very much. Many, many thanks, uh, Mr. Chicoma, also for your kind words, including uh, your encouraging words on the role of the, uh, the think tanks and the, the <coughs> study centers, and also for reminding us, for underlining uh, how comprehensive is the climate change agenda uh, and how uh, necessary it is to try to establish the linkages between uh, the various issues. Now I uh, have the pleasure to give the floor to Vivian Foster, uh, Chief Economist for the Infrastructure, Vice Presidency of Advanced Presidency of the World Bank. Um, as indicated by many specialized uh, bodies and organizations, uh, there is indeed a huge gap in, uh, in infrastructure investment. Uh, there has been, there are many uh, <laughs> estimates of this gap, but the point is that there is uh, a widely recognized uh, need to find new ways and means uh, to uh, encourage investment in infrastructure, perhaps uh, with new forms, for instance, of uh, private-public uh, partnership, but also to introduce new parameters and criteria to ensure that this investment uh, can uh, um, guarantee the sustainability of infrastructure and also that the infrastructure are uh, in line with the goals of the uh, sustainability agenda. So please, uh, uh, Dr. Foster, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Greco. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Distinguished participants, during these brief remarks, I'll take a developing country perspective on climate change and I will try to highlight some of the major areas of action needed by the leaders of the G20, as well as unresolved research and policy questions for the global think tank community. 
Energy and transportation systems together account for about 70% of carbon emissions globally. It follows that without decarbonizing energy and transport infrastructure, we simply cannot achieve net zero by mid-century. Developing countries now account for a substantial share of global carbon emissions from both energy and transportation, as well as the bulk of anticipated emissions growth. So their future trajectory is critical to the achievement of global targets. However, the story of decarbonization is very different between the energy and transport sectors, as we'll now see. Let's start with energy, where there has been encouraging progress. Renewable energy now accounts for the vast majority of new electricity generation capacity additions. Although long asset lives means that the share of renewable electricity actually generated is creeping up much more slowly and still only accounts for about a quarter of the total. Renewable electricity generation is now cost competitive with fossil fuels on a levelized cost of energy basis in an increasing range of contexts. Recent solar auctions in the developing world are now delivering remarkably low prices of around two cents a kilowatt hour. However, due to the intermittent nature of renewable energy, there's still a need to combine with other resources such as hydropower and gas to achieve firm energy supply. Therefore, battery storage remains the key to overcoming intermittency and allowing full substitution of renewable for thermal energy. While costs of batteries are coming down rapidly, significant challenges still remain in widespread deployment of batteries. These include how to price the complex range of battery services to incentivize investment. Also, how to ensure adequate supply of rare earth minerals for the manufacture of batteries, since these are sourced mainly from fragile and conflict affected states across the developing world. Until recently, policy focus has been on promoting uptake of clean energy. However, equally important for successful decarbonization is how to support countries in decommissioning the fossil fuel value chain all the way from mines to power stations, according to just transition principles. Relative to advanced economies, developing countries face the additional just transition challenge of ensuring that decarbonization does not come at the expense of universal access. However, a key problem is that the rate of renewable penetration remains much higher in the electricity sector at 27% than in the heating or cooling sector at only 9% or the transport sector at just 3%. This reflects greater technical challenges for these other uses, as well as about twice as much effort dedicated by policymakers to electricity than to other uses of energy, according to the World Bank's policy index rise. Increasingly, the solution is seen in terms of migrating these other energy uses, heating, cooling, transportation, onto electricity to hasten their decarbonization in a process that's becoming known as the electrification of everything. Let's turn now to the transport sector, where the process of decarbonization is much further behind and the challenge is more complicated due to the different transport modes involved, road, rail, sea, air. Also, there are many different transport actors whose behavior needs to be modified. It's helpful to think about the decarbonization of transport in terms of three levers, avoid, shift, and improve. The avoid lever means using territorial planning to reduce the need for travel, for example, by better design of cities, restructuring of global value chains, or migration of services onto digital platforms. The shift lever means switching as many trips as possible from more carbon intensive modes, such as private road transportation and aviation, to less carbon intensive modes, such as public road transportation, rail, river and air, and sea. The improved lever means reducing the carbon footprint of all transportation modes. Increasingly, this will mean shifting to electric vehicles for passengers and lighter loads, as well as potentially to hydrogen fuel for heavier loads. In many advanced economies, much of the policy discussion on the decarbonization of transport centers on the adoption of electric vehicles, maybe because the existing transportation is already relatively efficient and renewable penetration on the power grid is rising. However, in many developing countries, these two assumptions do not hold and there is greater scope to focus on transitional measures to bring down the carbon footprint of transportation, particularly reducing the emissions intensity of road transport through scrapping older vehicles, tightening fuel efficiency standards, 
improving public transportation systems and raising vehicle occupancy ratios. As the impetus toward decarbonization of energy and transportation accelerates, a pressing cross-cutting issue is the creation of a rational framework for energy pricing. Fossil fuel subsidies continue to depress energy prices and encourage wasteful consumption. Distorted electricity tariff structures may prevent a rational uptake of rooftop solar and electric vehicles. And ultimately, carbon taxation will be needed to provide the correct price signal for energy consumption. Finally, international cooperation such as the D20 and development assistance is crucial to support developing countries in making the transition. And my presentation has highlighted many of the pending research questions relevant to think tanks. As part of this process, the World Bank recently announced its Climate Change Action Plan, committing the organization to be 100% Paris compliant by mid-2023. In sum, the decarbonization of energy and transport sectors in the developing world lies very much on the critical path to net zero emissions by mid-century. Thank you. Many, many thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Foster. Uh, I think it was uh, very important to underline both the progress that has been made, but also the complexity of both the political and the technical tasks uh, we are facing uh, in advancing the sustainability agenda. So many thanks again, our two speakers. It was a, a, an excellent uh, start of this second uh, session. And uh, since we are already a little bit behind the schedule, I give immediately the floor to Dr. Federico Leoni of Sky TV, TV who will moderate uh, the next two panels. Please, uh, uh, Dr. Leoni, uh, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Greco. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the first panel of the second session of this uh, Think20 Global Policy Forum. Uh, we're going to talk about climate and energy, and in particular in this panel we will discuss how the G20 can coordinate national efforts uh, to tackle the challenge of climate change and to manage an orderly energy uh, transition. Uh, as you may know, uh, according to the International Monetary Fund in the G20 countries, out of the total $15 trillion fiscal stimulus, uh, uh, only $1.8 trillion is going to be spent in so-called green uh, sectors. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to introduce our three panelists. Uh, Luis De Mayo, lead co-chair of the Think20 Task Force on Climate Change, Sustainable Energy and Environment at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. De Mayo is also director of the Policy Studies branch at the Economics Department. Juna Rima, co-chair of the same uh, T20 task force, uh, is also senior policy fellow at the Economic Research Institute of the ASEAN uh, Southeast Nations Association. And the last one, Bob Perciasepe, president of the Center for Climate and Energy Solution in the US. Thank you all, glad to, thank you for being with us. Mr. De Mayo, uh, my first question is, uh, is for you, Professor De Mayo. Uh, beyond the pandemic, uh, climate change is uh, the main challenge of our time. Uh, what are the main lines of action for the G20 elaborated by your task force? You have uh, five minutes. Uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you, much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Federico. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, to share with you today the uh, the main uh, proposals of the task force. Uh, the task force has basically identified a, a number of policy relevant uh, proposals to make the most of the opportunity that this crisis is offering us. Uh, to make progress towards decarbonizing our, our economies uh, in, the, in the years to come. Um, basically, what the task force is proposing can be, can be grouped in six main areas, and I'll try to, 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 to say a few words about, uh, about them. The first message really is, is about uh, you know, lowering the carbon intensity of growth after the pandemic. And the G20 can take the lead in global efforts uh, in this area, basically to align climate uh, and investment trade policies, as well as, as legal frameworks. Take, for instance, the area of green investment. There is a proposal to establish a low carbon finance facility, for example, that can basically catalyze funds uh, for, uh, for the recovery. Funds mobilized this way can also be accompanied by the use of economic instruments 
um, such as subsidies, tax incentives, to encourage decarbonization. This is particularly important to finance needed investment in energy uh, efficiency, and we're going to hear that from my uh, fellow co-chair, Juno Rima, in, in, in a minute. Uh, another area that the task force uh, uh, has a proposal is to define under the aegis of the G20 uh, a green rating agency uh, based on globally accepted definitions of green bonds uh, that can be used to foster the development uh, of a global green bond uh, market. In the area of trade, for instance, another proposal of the task force refers to setting globally accepted rules for border, border carbon adjustment mechanisms uh, so that they cannot be used uh, as, a, as an instrument to hide the protectionism. A second message uh, that the task force is putting forward is to recognize that in addition to the economic instruments that I mentioned, there are nature-based solutions uh, to tackle climate uh, change. For instance, one proposal is to restore, uh, to support uh, platforms uh, with targets uh, in the area of forest, uh, restoring forest ecosystems, reducing air pollution in cities, uh, support the green go coasts in small island developing states, raise their share of renewables and energy, uh, and, and, and so on. A third uh, point that, uh, that the task force is stressing uh, has to do with supporting just the transitions towards climate neutral economies. For instance, by creating a G20 forum on energy poverty to foster institutional dialogue, to disseminate best regulatory practices and business models uh, in this area. Also to endorse the concept uh, of energy communities as a way of bringing together citizens and stakeholders uh, during this uh, energy uh, uh, transition and to fight uh, energy poverty as well. Another point with this establishment of a G20 Commission uh, for the quality, to, prov to provide quality youth education for climate change and sustainable uh, development, which is an important element here as well in just transition. A fourth message is about preserving marine bio biodiversity and, uh, and natural protected areas. For instance, a proposal is to full implement, fully implement the UN Red Plus mechanism, the new Red Plus Blue Carbon mechanism, and other mechanisms uh, that can, uh, can work uh, to this end, such as regenerative agriculture, for example. A fifth message uh, is about uh, food and water security. This is essentially about promoting and supporting international coordination for the smart repurposing uh, of agricultural subsidies that could be carried out under the leadership of the G20. For instance, strengthening the Ag Incentives Consortium uh, to assess alternative options, to basically align them with objectives of sustainability and efficiency mm -hmm. of systems, poverty reduction, food security, and so on, uh, is another element that task force uh, is identifying uh, uh, towards uh, uh, improving uh, food and water security as we move forward. And a final message, and I'll stop here, uh, is about how the G20 can support the circular economy. And their ideas are basically about how to establish guiding principles for the use of plastics, to promote research and innovation on alternatives to the use this is something that will uh, require investment in waste management infrastructure globally, a focus on finding ways to create a greater circularity for plastics and waste in our, in our economies. And a final point, which is also a concrete proposal of the task force, is to support the creation and adherence to consistent measuring, reporting, verification, and certification of the emissions content of internationally traded products. A lot has been said in previous panels uh, about data, and that's one contribution of the task force uh, to this area as well, with a view to improving verification and certification. And I'll stop here. Thank you again for the opportunity to share these thoughts uh, and the work of the task force. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. De Mayo. Um, uh, Dr. Arima, um, uh, we have heard that we don't have, uh, uh, we do not have a single path to reach our goal. Uh, but to achieve our global commitments in fighting climate crisis, uh, the transition to clean energy is key. 
Uh, so how to support and, and facilitate it? Oh, thank you very much. And then uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to participate in this discussion. And I'd like to talk particularly about energy efficiency uh, because uh, it is an immediate and effective option uh, for transforming energy systems. And that could be regarded as uh, quite often low hanging fruit. And improvement of energy efficiency uh, means cutting out waste and bring down uh, the per unit cost of lighting and so heating uh, refrigeration and other services. And it can also uh, help reducing uh, pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, that contribute to energy security. So uh, that is why uh, the uh, SDG 7 has set a particular uh, target uh, for doubling uh, the improvement of energy, energy efficiency by 2030. And actually, uh, both developed and developing countries are making their efforts uh, for improving energy intensity. But uh, the looking at the figure, um, there seems to be some deficit in policy making. Uh, since 2015, uh, global improvement in energy intensity is uh, slowing down. And actually, uh, the COVID-19 is uh, adding additional uh, burden and then uh, the ongoing investment in energy efficiency dropped drastically uh, because of the COVID-19. And the investment needs uh, to grow uh, steadily at the rate closer to 20% annually uh, for maximizing all available energy efficiency potential uh, requires uh, 584 billion US dollars uh, between now and 2025 every year and also uh, nearly 1.3 trillion US dollar uh, per year between 2026 and 2040. So how to incentivize uh, that kind of vast uh, financial resources? Uh, that's a big question. And then uh, we need um, uh, the finance and investment for energy efficiency improvements to achieve climate related goal. And then uh, the uh, policy brief, uh, which we have taken up, uh, identified several key uh, recommendations. Uh, first of all, fiscal policy instruments, such as subsidy and tax exemptions. Uh, that is very much classical, but are still useful uh, policies. And second, a voluntary agreement uh, between government and enterprises can be also efficient. But of course, uh, the challenge is how to uh, ensure proper monitoring and um, uh, the planning. And a third recommendation is, um, you know, the emissions trading scheme, and it is actually implemented in the EU, but uh, the, its impact on energy efficiency remains to be seen, and um, uh, it may not be always the case. Rather, uh, market-based instruments such as energy efficiency obligation or uh, the tendering scheme are very much cost-effective uh, instrument that can be reduced energy intensity. And then uh, the green adjusted greenhouse gas emission taxation is also recommended to be applied. And then tax needs to be based on the adjusted greenhouse gas emissions. And also uh, the collected taxes uh, could be used uh, for incentivizing green and energy efficiency project so that uh, the rate of return of these projects could be higher. And uh, the uh, unifying uh, the definition of green bond has been already mentioned by Luis. And, uh, you know, that is an excellent idea because, you know, the uh, different definition of green bond is very much cumbersome and also very much confusing. So I think uh, one of the unique area uh, where G20 can collaborate is to consider unified uh, the definition of green bond as suggested by Luis. And then, uh, and as well, uh, the uh, in uh, rating uh, green bond, uh, we also need to say have uh, the green rating agencies uh, based on the uh, unified uh, uh, the methodology. So uh, that is uh, the indispensable part uh, for making green bond as a useful infrastructure uh, for uh, say incentivizing financial flow. Uh, to environmental friendly areas. So I think uh, I could stop here and uh, looking forward to have further discussion. Thank you. Now the last question is for uh, uh, Dr. Bob Perciasepe. Uh, uh, we, uh, Dr. De Mayo said that we need uh, uh, an energy transition that should be fair 
and just. Uh, so what role do you see for the private sector supporting the fight against climate change in a way that, the, that it also uh, take into account justice and equity towards vulnerable peoples? Uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. And also, um, let me just thank uh, the Italian Institute for International Studies and the think tank and civil societies from the University of Pennsylvania for helping organize the global policy forum here. It's a real honor to be with all of you and, and to hear the recommendations of the task force. Thank you both co-chairs for the work that you've done. You know, um, one of the issues that can strengthen even the recommendations in the G20s work is for the G20 to, to recognize some of its political power around the world uh, as the major uh, economies of the world and how much influence it can have because there's a there's a an espousing of the of the ambition as well as the deeds that is really important for them to communicate at, in the meeting coming up uh, this fall so and of course that leads up to the conference of parties in glasgow so i don't want to lose that that larger impact that the G20 has, even though we're looking, you know, as think tanks do at some of the specific things that we would want them to work on, they have that big signaling uh, capacity and, and, uh, and ability that I think is vitally important when they issue communiques. I mean, we saw it just recently with the G7, uh, all of them agreeing to a, a net zero goal, which I think would be great for the G20 to do the same thing. Now, in doing that, and we've already heard about some of the transitional issues and energy poverty and you know, the distribution of energy benefits in, a global, in the global economy and, the, and in global society, uh, we have billions of people that are uh, not, at an not at an energy level or have availability of energy uh, to raise up their standard of living. But on the other side of that, as we look at climate change and, and all of the work that needs to get done, there's also the disproportionate impact of climate change. And we have to recognize at this point that we are going to get awfully close to 1.5 degrees and maybe more in terms of global temperature average increases, no matter what we do here. And, and as the uh, IPCC, which has already been uh, discussed, has identified there are significant global impacts at one and a half degree centigrade uh, increase in global temperatures. And the G20 should be sending some stronger signals about uh, looking at that, those dis disproportionate impacts of communities around, around the world. I mean, even in the developed world, which has more capacity, uh, we're already seeing these things in terms of heat in cities, uh, flooding, drought, uh, these things are hard for any society to control, uh, you know, once they start to happen and they're starting to happen. And so really having a, a finer point on how um, the G20 could send the signal for dealing with these disproportionate impacts around around the world, because it is really the the people who are already in energy poverty and, and the peoples who live in these high impacted and potentially high impacted areas that are going to suffer the most as the developed world tries to figure out how to reduce its emissions. So uh, this is an important messaging, I think, that has to come out of G20 and also into the conference of parties as they start you know, working on implementation of the Paris Agreement. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that I think is really important here is for us to remember that we have, we're approaching a $90 trillion dollar I think it's 80 something trillion dollar US dollars uh, global economy. You know, we need to steer some of that. We we're talking about a trillion here and a trillion there. If we can get 10% of the global economy moving in a different direction, that really can make a difference. And to do that, we really need to engage the private sector. The private sector is often thought of as a side event you know, uh, for the G20 or, or for even the Conference of Parties. And really, we need to find a way to bring them in and, and capitalize on their own spending in their own direction. What we're finding is that more and more companies are committing to a net zero in and of their own facilities and their own activities in having 
said that, it's awfully hard for them to achieve those goals by themselves without some intervention and assistance and partnership with policy uh, with the government. So a G20 that looks at these disproportionate impact and also pulls the private sector more into these discussions because that's where the capital is right now. There's a lot of capital flowing globally. We need to move it more toward these priorities. So I will stop there uh, to in this further uh, discussion that we are having. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all of our uh, panelists. Luis de Mayo, lead co-chair of the uh, Think20 Task Force on Climate Change, Sustainable Energy and Environment. Uh, uh, June Arima, co-chair of the same uh, uh, Think20 Task Force. And Bob Perciasepe, president of the Center for Climate and Energy Solution. You know, reshaping uh, the energy system is uh, perhaps the main challenge challenge in the struggle against climate crisis and uh, we have just talked about about this this big uh, uh, big challenge now uh, the time is running out so let's go straight uh, uh, to the second panel of the second session of this uh, uh, t20 global policy forum this panel is focused on uh, sustainable infrastructure. Um, let, me, uh, let me introduce our uh, three other panelists. Uh, I don't know if they are uh, ready for... Uh, for uh, uh, okay, I can see them. Uh, Francesco Profumo, lead co-chair of the Think20 Task Force on infra of Infrastructure Investment and Financing. Profumo is also, as you may know, president of Compagnia San Paolo in Italy. Gioisha Dutra, co-chair of the same T20 Task Force. Uh, she is also director of, of the Center for Regulatory and Infrastructure Studies at the Getulio Vargas Foundation in Brazil. Uh, Naoyuki Yoshino, former Dean, uh, Asian Development, uh, Development Bank Institute, Professor Emeritus at the Keio University in uh, uh, Japan. Let me start from Mr. Profumo. Um, uh, the important role of infrastructures has been uh, uh, reaffirmed by the G7 uh, leaders. Uh, uh, Professor Profumo, how can the G20 support sustainable infrastructures to build a, a more resilient growth? You have five minutes, the floor is yours. We cannot hear you, Mr. Pro, uh, Mr. Profumo, sorry for the inconvenience, uh, maybe some problem okay. with your microphone? Okay, thank you. Okay. A very good afternoon to everyone. First of all, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to the T20 National Coordinator ISPI and uh, to the think tank and the civil society program at the University of Pennsylvania for organizing and inviting me to this very important and timely event. With the pandemic as a backdrop, we are now keenly aware of the critical role that infrastructure played for the response to the COVID-19 crisis. We also know that infrastructure will play an important role in the recovery phase as a powerful vector for boosting economic activities and for meeting social and environmental goals. With this idea in my mind, the T20 Infrastructure Task Force has worked towards designing robust and forward-looking policy solutions to overcome current challenges and make infrastructure more resilient, smart, green, and inclusive, while remaining a driver for the development and share prosperity. During these last months, we have identified a four-fold agenda on infrastructure, which focuses on data and technology, urbanization, social infrastructure in smart cities, mobilize capital and markets for sustainable infrastructure and resilient infrastructure. Around these key macro teams, several policy recommendation areas have been consolidated. Let me start with the data and technology. The digital transformation will play a pivotal role in how to conceptualize the infrastructure for the decades to come. The sharing of data and pioneering innovations such as cloud computing, artificial intelligence, digital twins, 
5G and IoT offer great potential to transform how infrastructure is designed and operate to enhance its productivity, efficiency, and affordability. In this regard, we are convinced of the necessity to integrate digitalization and system modeling throughout the full life cycle of infrastructure to strengthen cross-border data management and improve data quality, and to promote value chain integration through the use of federated digital platform. A green and just recovery starts from cities. Yes, cities are currently facing budget and capacity constraints requiring further efforts to meet the social and environmental goals. Through the policy recommendation of our working group, we encourage promoting a more systematic convergence between social innovation and economic infrastructure investments with the goal to reduce inequality and improve inclusions. Building sustainability responses at the local level can also uh, for a new management of urban-rural interdependencies. We need to foster policy actions, promote higher diversity standards, to accelerate the transition toward decarbonization and circular economy, and to improve quality of life while mitigating the financial gap. In the context of a strained infrastructure investments, tax fueled budget will not be sufficient to close the infrastructure gap. Mobilizing capital and market for clean and sustainable infrastructure in both development and the de developing countries will be crucial. The creation of a positive enabling environment is a necessary condition for this to happen. Sound policies, effective institutions, transparencies and reliable contracts are key enable factors, but also risk management encourage to strengthen the attractiveness of infrastructure investment for considering environmental, social, and government criteria, and by incorporating digital technologies that monitor and improve efficiencies. These are all fundamental prerequisites for developing successful infrastructure investment plan and for accelerating the path towards a clean energy recovery. The final point that I want to make is about the resiliency. From the pandemic experience, it's evident that the cost of crisis can be much higher than the incremental cost implied to invest in resiliency and mental. Building resilient infrastructure is an investment to increase asset life a significantly lower operation and management cost, promoting new and innovative facing solutions and standardized rating to incorporate the maintenance and the resilience principles in infrastructure project represent a necessary step for building high quality infrastructure. The G20 is the right forum for taking on these pressing global challenges for promoting actions for financing more high quality green and resilience infrastructure and for leading the transition towards a more prosperous, inclusive and resilient future. As the 320 Working Group on Infrastructure Investment and Financing, we are ready to support in this effort. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Profumo. Now I have a question for uh, Joisha Dutra. Uh, let's go back to the concept of fairness. Building uh, resilient infrastructures uh, is crucial to ensure uh, sustainable development, especially for emerging uh, economies. Uh, how can this be linked to the concept of fairness and just energy transi transition? Good morning, good afternoon and good day. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in such relevant forum, sharing discussions and findings that we T20 Task Force 7 has advanced. The recently released IEA report, Financing Clean Energy Transitions, in collaboration with the World Economic Forum and the World Bank, presents a considerable funding gap for emerging and developing economies, EMDE, 
to meet sustainable development goals. Data from the report shows us that this group of countries account for approximately 40% of energy investments in emission, in emissions reduction under the IEA climate-driven scenarios. However, these countries hold together only 10% of the global wealth. Investments in EMDE should increase, according to the report, from $150 billion to $1 trillion to meet climate goals from 2026 to 2030. This amount represents a major increase and the private capital share should grow significantly. What have we witnessed so far? Intentions underlying key narratives, net zero pledges and decarbonization show a significant disconnect from reality in terms of investments needed and climate commitments. Policies, regulations, and dysfunctional market designs have contributed to a big portion of risks underlying the investment gap pointed out by the IEA report. These elements are crucial to, prom to promote sustainable investments in infrastructure in EMDs and may not have been properly accounted for in the report. Adding to this complexity, there is also the resilience dimension and associated implementation challenges. Sustainable infrastructure investments in a post-COVID-19 world must deliver resilient ones. Resiliency to climate variability, cyber attacks, and pandemics. This distinct feature is related and connected to the institutional layer I mentioned. Policy, regulations, and market designs that often go overlooked in EMDE investment puzzle. Climate, cyber attacks, and pandemics are not new risks. We have been aware of them and their potential to disrupt people and societies for at least 15 years or so. In the aftermath of the 2008 crisis, economists increasingly have turned to the concept of government failure to explain it. The 2020 crisis can also, to a large extent, be explained by government's failures or at least challenging their capacity to respond and illustrate the lack of preparedness. As a final comment, a question emerges. How can we effectively contribute to change this landscape? How can we help design a different governance for public-private collaboration to address challenges stemming from providing resilient infrastructure also in EMDE at scale by developing an evidence-based framework that can contribute to de-risk investments in sustainable and critical infrastructures in emerging markets in developing economies. This is even more important when we consider that Europe and the US will be fierce competitors in the rush for infrastructure investments in the years to come, as can be seen from the European Green Deal and Biden's infrastructure plan. I will stop now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dutra. Uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, now I have a question for Professor Yoshino. Uh, we already said that more investment needs to be channeled uh, towards infrastructure projects. Uh, what innovative policies and strategies uh, could be designed to bring private investors into infrastructure uh, investments? Okay, thank you very much for inviting me for this important panel. And also, I'd like to thank uh, ISPI, Paolo, for asking me to have a chance. I think as for the private investors, risks associated infrastructure is very large, and the rate of returns are relatively low. 
So that was the main problem why private investors were reluctant to came into infrastructure investment. So it is important to bring new sources of uh, additional revenues into infrastructure investors. Traditionally, investors relied on user fees and users prefer low price, but investors preferred high rate of return. So PPP had some conflicts between the two from the beginning. That's why in Latin America and in Asia, PPP had not been so successful. So we have to think about to bring other sources of revenues to private investment. Good private investment, infrastructure investment, will bring new businesses into the region, new residential area, and then small businesses can start their own shops and tax revenues and property tax revenues, sales tax revenues, all those tax revenues will rise. In the past, all those tax revenues went to the government and they were not returned to private infrastructure investors. They only received user fees. So I'm proposing to bring 50% of those spillover tax revenues to infrastructure investors. That can uh, increase the rate of return for private investors and spillover tax revenues are coming every year. So that will be very sustainable and long-term nature. And how do we measure spillover tax revenues? In econometrics, we have difference in difference method. To look at the region along new infrastructure compared to the region uh, which has no impact from those infrastructures. But practically, we can have some rule of thumb. After the completion of infrastructure, the tax revenues will increase into the region. Then we can look at the national average of tax revenues and compare with the region which has positively affected. And those differences we can call as spillover tax revenues. And then share those spillover tax revenues, 50% goes to government, 50% be returned to private investors. Then private investors has a big uh, incentive to develop the region, not only just constructing infrastructure, but to provide job creations and new businesses. Then the region along infrastructure will be much faster to be developed. And last one is tax collection is very important. In many Asian countries, in Latin America, developing countries, tax evasion is observed. So for example, satellite photo can be taken. Then they can watch how many people are using restaurants, how many people are using uh, commercial buildings. Then they can estimate the income of those businesses. Even in agricultural farmers, after the completion of road, their sales may go up. Then satellite photo can be taken, how many trucks are coming to the agricultural farmland? Then they can estimate the amount of sales and tax revenue can be properly collected. So those tax evasion should be uh, stopped and also 50% of those tax revenue should be returned. Last point is land acquisition is very difficult in many Asian countries in order to complete their road and the electric power and so on. And land lease, land trust is one of the ways to smoothen keeping the land ownership as their own, but lease the land to infrastructure businesses. And that can smoothen the transfer, usage transfer of the road and so on. And that will mitigate the construction period and reduce construction period and operation can be started uh, much faster. So those are my proposals. And it is important to find out spillover tax return that can increase the rate of return for private investors. And that can attract many long-term and short-term private investors. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Professor Yoshino. Perfect timing, too. Uh, let me now thank all of our panelists. Francesco Profumo, lead co-chair of the Think20 Task Force on Infrastructure Investment and Financing. Joy Shadutra, co-chair of the same T20 Task Force. Uh, and Professor Naoyuki Yoshino from the Asian Development Bank Institute. Uh, we have uh, had the opportunity to talk about some uh, valuable ideas and you know the very goal of the Think20 is to produce uh, ideas, uh, strong ideas that can really shape uh, the world of uh, uh, tomorrow. Um, I'm going to conclude uh, and now I leave the floor to uh, Paolo Magri and James McGann for the closing remarks for uh, uh, of this uh, day. Thank you and goodbye. Magri McGann, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, wow! This is my short, very short and informal takeaway of the first day of the Global Policy Forum. Wow to the enlightening panelists, an incredible mixture of vision and realism. Wow to our moderator who managed elegantly to respect our tight schedule and why to the technical support staff uh, in the backstage, uh, bravo. We still have one day to go, but bravo uh, today. It would be a mission, mission impossible to wrap up in two minutes the richness of the debate and to make a summary of the multiple takeaways. But uh, for mission impossible, we are used to turn to Jim and this is exactly what I will do as well right now. Jim, you have the floor. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, you should have said wow in Italian because uh, it is, uh, I'm, uh, you know, bellissimo, uh, <laughs> fantastico, uh, a uh, tour de force in terms of uh, the participants at the meeting today. We started in. Uh, with Kevin Rudd, who said, in ideas, institutions, and leadership matter, I would add clearly that think tanks matter. They, and it is incredibly demonstrated by the participation of the policymakers and the think tanks in bridging that gap. What this is all about was amply, demonstrably de uh, demonstrated today. Our goal both ISPI and TTCSP and the global think tanks around the world is to help make think tanks and the T20 be more inclusive, more representative, more policy relevant and agile. And as this format demonstrated so ably, so effectively uh, through the prowess of the ISPI staff is that we are more computer, more internet, more digitally savvy, and that is important to reach think tanks around the world, that this format enables us to do so. The ideas were brilliant. Uh, the engagement was extraordinary. The reach is beyond what all of us could want or expect, uh, and we will continue with this tomorrow the ideas were fantastic. The reach will of the, these ideas will reach into tomorrow and well beyond. So thank you, ISPI. Thanks to all of you who have joined us today for this fantastic journey uh, with ISPI and all of the speakers uh, and panelists at this wonderful global policy forum for people, prosperity, and the planet. Good evening, good morning for some, and thank you all, goodbye. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow.